Good evening, everyone. I'm going to call this meeting to order. I am not Mayor Bussey, as you may be able to tell. Um, I am Councilmember Jenna Carter, but am acting mayor because our uh, current mayor does not feel as well today. So bear with me. You can laugh along with me as I mess up. Um, it's inevitable. Um, but with that, we'll get us started here. So we're going to do the roll call. Acting Mayor Carter? Present. Councilmember Coulter? Present. Councilmember Lohman? Here. Councilmember Nelson? Here. Councilmember Martin? Here. Councilmember D'Alessandro? Present. All right. Uh, with that, I would like everybody to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Great. So next up on the agenda is approving our agenda for this evening. Uh, do we have anybody that wants to make any amendments to the agenda? Mayor, um, I'd like to see if we could move item 5.2 uh, in front of 5.1, uh, simply because we have a uh, you know a, a public uh, uh, or a commenting period uh, in the in the item 5.1 doesn't doesn't necessarily have one. So if we could move those two around. Um, uh, Madam Mayor and Council Member staff is fine doing that. Okay. Are there any other changes, requests to change to the agenda? Okay. So with that, I would like to move um, to adopt tonight's agenda with the change of item 5.2 uh, to make that the first item under our organizational business, followed by the HRE assessment 2022 legislative session review and then the city council policy and issue update. Second. All right, so uh, we have a motion and a second to adopt tonight's agenda as stated. With no further council discussion, all those in favor signify by saying yeah, aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Okay, so with that, we will move on to item two on our agenda. Am I saying that right? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so we have uh, Miss Jackson will be joining us for our um, mission moment and we'll be it, I have it on the agenda as introduction to racial equity action teams I assume you're going to you tell us more about what what is about to happen absolutely uh, thank you acting mayor Carter and council I'm really excited to be here tonight about a year ago um, it was right around this time July 2021 I was introducing to you the newly formed racial equity action teams. And so I'm excited to be back here tonight for the second time. And we have a report on all the things that our racial equity teams have been doing. As you recall, these are staff led teams that are charged with operationalizing the racial equity work that we have in the city of Bloomington within their own departments. And so we have with us today our community development racial equity action team, community services read, and also our legal read to give their presentations. Uh, we'll start with community development and we're just going to continue in alphabetical order uh, and then we will have some time at the end for them all to join at the podium and then you can have any questions that you may uh, you can ask any questions that you may have for them and then later on July 11th we'll have our remaining weeks here to present uh, and a few weeks after that I'll be back in front of you so you'll get to see a lot of me over the next few weeks uh, with an overall update on the equity inclusion work that we're doing in the city of Bloomington. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Meredith, who will give the presentation for the, the Community Development Racial Equity Action Team. Good evening, council members, acting mayor. My name is Meredith Vandeweg, and I'm here today on behalf of the CD REIT team. We're gonna be talking about some of our accomplishments from our 2021 work plan, as well as some of the focused items that we have for our 2022-2023 work plan. Um, so slide. Before I begin, it would be neglectful of me not to highlight the members of the Community Development Racial Equity Action Team. These are players that put in the work and effort above and beyond their daily responsibilities and duties of their career and job requirements. So none of this work would be possible without them, and I wanna just make sure to take a moment to appreciate the time and efforts that they continue to put forth. So some of our top initiatives, slide. 
have continued to follow us through from our 2021 work plan into our 2022-23, in part because as many of us know, this work can't always happen overnight, so these are continuous top initiatives, but some of the subgroups and identifying different goals and challenges have changed. So we're gonna to continue to work on city code and related policy reviews. Anybody who's worked with code knows that that is in-depth work and takes time um, and efforts from the community. So we're still working on that. Engagement with underrepresented businesses is still top of mind, as well as youth recruitment to work with the city, specifically community development, and including new research for assistance programs to help where we can within the community development team. Slide. So some of the things that we've accomplished, before I delve into what we're working on now, I wanna make sure we highlight the things that we've really tackled over the last almost two years of this team forming. We are continuing to grow and expand within community development and our CD REIT team, which is super exciting. It means our work is, is going forward and we are excited to bring that passion to others that are joining our team. Um, so some of the things that we've worked on and have completed, the repeal of the crime-free provisions from city rental code, as well as the family definition no longer being part of the rental housing code. Some of that was a direct response to working with Bloomington community members, hearing their requirements and making those changes accordingly. As well as working with our communications team to help form Bloomington Collective Stories of Solidarity, they have done a fabulous job highlighting some of our BIPOC members and done a wonderful job in making sure that those voices and stories are heard on all different platforms, including on YouTube. If you do one thing tonight and you walk away from this presentation, I ask you to look at those videos because they're really amazing. We've had a lot of work done with our SAC, Small Business Deferral and Credit Policy that's been brought forth before you. It's a hard thing to tackle, but for, if you're a startup business and you're just starting out, to kind of have the challenges of facing additional costs where we can help defer and credit some of that makes a huge difference and helps bring down some of those barriers for first-time business and multi-generational businesses. We also have been one of only two departments to implement the pilot for the racial equity impact assessment. So we are working on that and live with that to bring that forward to you. I think we've used it in the housing, the rental housing code, utilize that tool. We're utilizing it throughout anything that comes forward to you. There's successes there, there's also room for improvement, so we're providing that feedback where and when it's uh, necessary. We had several of us join in completion of the U of M Business Retention and Expansion Program over the last year in hopes to help fuel additional knowledge as we go forward, some of our small business initiatives. Our community business survey results went live, and we have now secured some funding for the Small Business Resource Center. Slide. So now that I've kind of showed some of the things that we've accomplished here, some of the things that we're tackling, and we know these are not overnight changes, but we're gonna to continue to work on them. City code review, um, this is in information, we're kind of focusing on items that are staff driven, things that we're hearing from the public as well as the business, and one of those is to continue that pilot department for the RIA tool. Um, so it's been used to be brought forth to you guys, and we'll continue to do so. We hope to kind of hone in on where it's working and maybe where it's not working um, so that we can bring back that feedback for other departments that might start utilizing that tool. We're also gonna work at getting an equitable development analysis tool, something similar to a development scorecard. This just seems like a fluid progression from the RIA tool that we could utilize in a means of evaluating the development applications through an equity lens. Slide. We're gonna continue with our business engagement and services evaluations. So for those of us who have been listening and hearing more about the Small Business Resource Center, we've had over 250,000 confirmed in funding for this. This is really coming to fruition and it's amazing. We still have 2.04 pending with potential funding to come. Um, so the McKnight and the ARP money, as well as looking at the former fire station three to be the actual brick and mortar location for this hopefully soon to be realized dream. We've got the business displacement or anti-displacement policy. This team is working on looking at local municipalities similar to Bloomington that are encouraging displacement or anti-displacement policies. This helps with making sure that we can help prevent gentrification of small businesses um, and continue to make sure that we encourage BIPOC and small business growth in our Bloomington neighborhoods. We're working on a business startup assistance program research modeling off of some of the HRA loan programs a revolving loan fund research as well, which it works on more specific and subcategory funds or matching plans that might be met with specific needs for the businesses, and then a facade improvement program research. Slide. And then we have our 
youth recruitment. So this is something that we're going to continue to work as many other departments are working on having gaps in employment. We've got people that are leaving the field and retiring and moving on. There's a need to fill those positions and we hope to fill those positions with passionate young youth and maybe local youth. So we are expand our internship program currently with two new interns. We have Aliyah Upshaw who is from um, Kennedy High School, and Jennifer Augustin Ambrosio, who came to us through Capital Pathways Program. They're working with us this summer. We also are working on uh, making those connections and partnerships with the career counselors at Kennedy High School, Valley View Middle School, and AVID programs. We have full intention of participating in local employment fairs. A lot of these things were kind of put on hold with COVID, so we hope to have a physical presence in the next 2022-23 year. <laughs> And then we hope to have this partnership with Brooklyn program, or at least learn from something that they have. So instead of recreating the wheel, for those of you who are maybe part of our equity at the center a couple weeks back, we were able to hear Curtis O'Neill speak about the Brooklyn pro program at uh, Brooklyn Center in Brooklyn Park. And we think she's got something really fabulous going on there. So if there's a way that we can implement, encourage, and you know, partner with her, we think that there's a huge future there for us. So that's a little bit of the work that we've got going on for our 2022-2023 work plan, and I'd be happy to take any questions at the end of this presentation from our REIT teams. Thank you for your time. <laughs> um. Uh, hello, um, Acting Mayor, Council members. Um, my name is Kelly DeWeese, and I'm with the Community Services Racial, Equi Racial Equity Action Team um, slide. So just an overview of the things we're going to go over today, um, our, our membership, um, our role, key highlights of the work that we've done over the last year to advance um, racial equity slide. Um, <laughs> I, will, I should have paused this a little bit. Um, I just introduced ourselves and went over the first slide. So if you want to introduce yourself. <laughs> I'm so sorry, you guys, for being just a little bit late. Um, my name is Afaf, and I'm one of the public health nurses at the city. Um, I've been with the city for about a year and a half. It's so nice to be here, and it's nice to meet all of you guys. Um, I'm sorry, could you speak into the mic a little bit? It's a oh, little I apologize. And I'm not sure if that mic is even on. Perfect. Yeah, Thank you. Perfect. Sorry. Hi, my name is Afaf. I'm one of the public health nurses for the city of Bloomington. Um, I've been here for about a year and a half, and it's nice to see all of you guys. And again, I apologize for being a little bit late. All right. Oh, and you want to introduce us? Perfect. Oh, sorry. No, I did not do that. <laughs> oh, all right. Sorry. Introduce myself. All right. So going forward. So this is our roster of members on the community service REIT team. We represent the communications, community outreach and engagement, and public health divisions. Um, we have seven members total. The administration division is about 14% of our group. Communications is about 14%. Community outreach and engagement, 29%, and public health is 43%. Slide. Um, so our role as the Racial Equity Action Team, um, we meet monthly and work to identify opportunities and increase staff awareness of our racial equity work throughout the department um, since in community services a large part of our work, our day-to-day -day routine work already is um, has to do with racial equity. So we want to, um, so our team has been highlighting those things that are already going on. Um, we send out a monthly newsletter to our um, department to recognize how staff are advancing racial equity and highlight key events and opportunities um, such as Black History Month celebrations, city proclamations, anti-racist um, anti trainings and resources and more. Um, we also serve as a sounding board for racial equity related workplace issues in the department. Um, so we've had some... Um, some of our department members um, have an issue or concern. Um, they've come to us and we've had discussions and, and um, worked to resolve those. Um, we, the team also engages in conversation about current issues and how they might, may impact staff and community members. Um, recently, for example, we um, discuss, participated in a discussion to reflect on the war in Ukraine and how it may impact immigrant and refugee communities in Bloomington, um, specifically refugees from Afghanistan um, that might be um, you know, triggered with how people are responding to one um, crisis and not the other. Mm -hmm. Slide. So, next we will showcase some of the work that our staff in the community um, services have done to advance racial equity. Slide, please. 
Okay. So the city joined the Just Eats Coalition in June 2021. We partner with volunteer lawyers to help property owners with discriminatory covenants discharge the covenants from their properties. We also coordinate and educate an outreach, uh, an outreach efforts in the community to build awareness about discrimination in housing. To date, we have received over 50 requests from residents for discharge assistance. To continue to build awareness, the city is hosting an event on August 9th at Bryant Park with food, speakers, activities for kids, and more. These efforts are led by the subcommittee of staff from community services and the legal department, the Human Rights Commission, and the Planning Committee. Slide. Another project um, that's going on are the Pride celebrations. So in 2021, um, Bloomington had its first Pride celebration. They, we estimated that there would be 500 attendees. Um, turns out there were close to 2,000. So that is going on again this year in 2022. Um, this year, entertainers and vendors will include more BIPOC individuals in the LBG. LGBTQ plus community. Um, our REIT team hosted a citywide opportunity for staff to view and discuss the art exhibit just down the hall, um, come as you are. And um, the goal for 2022 is um, to continue to ensure fun, safe, secure celebration. Slide. Mm -hmm. So the maternal child health team also started implementing what's called the MESH program this year, beginning in January. MESH stands for the Maternal Early Childhood Sustained Home Visiting Program. Um, home visits are completed during and after pregnancy. And what happens is nurses create a partnership with families to deliver services to enhance maternal and child outcomes. And an example of that would be promoting preventative care and safety to reduce emergency room visits and to um, make sure that child protective services involvement is lessened as well. I'm happy to say I'm part of that program and, and as soon as I started I was on that journey and I'm absolutely loving it. I see how families react to this program and it's been nothing but positivity so far so yeah. Next slide, please. Um, and the final thing we want to cover is how our department has been reducing, reducing racial disparities in vaccine coverage and other COVID-related disparities. Um, so one of the things that um, our department has been doing is sending out a weekly newsletter to over 350 community leaders. We've gotten really positive feedback about that newsletter. Um, it has information on COVID-19, vaccinations, community resources like um, financial assistance, food, um, all those sorts of things um, for community leaders to share with their community members. And that newsletter go has gone out in multiple languages um, so that we can reach a wide community. Um, last winter, we our department did a COVID listening session with BIPOC and other community leaders to hear um, their thoughts and what was going on. Um, and then throughout this whole thing, we've also just continued to talk with community leaders about the situation and to provide help and assistance um, and getting feedback from them on you know, things that they think we should be doing differently or, or start doing. And those are our presentation, I think, questions at the end. So, okay, great, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So our next presentation is gonna come from our legal department. And I was all prepared to filibuster just so we could give people time <laughs> to make their way to the screen, but it looks like I may not have to do that. But since I'm standing here, I'll talk. And I'll just wanna say one thing quickly here is that um, the racial equity action teams is sort of like framework for this work is something that's a part of the GARE foundational training. And so GARE advises government agencies to stand up teams to be able to help carry out the work. And so it's not something that's unique to Bloomington. Uh, but one of the things that I've encountered both in doing this work in other organizations and also just in having conversations with my colleagues is that typically the REITs start off with a lot of energy and excitement and their groups, people are volunteering to lead the work and then they start to dwindle a bit. And so the challenge for my colleagues who will lead equity and inclusion work across the country is how do we keep that energy sustained and how do we make sure people are really excited about doing this work? Uh, one of the things that I'm really proud of in Bloomington is that our energy continues to increase. In fact, we've added more members <laughs> to the REIT teams uh, over the last year. In fact, I had a question from um, Bernadette today. She was like, babe, how many people can we have? 
<laughs> on our team. And so I'm really excited about the presentation that's been given in the one that you'll see before uh, and the others that you'll see in a few weeks. But I just wanted to take time to acknowledge these amazing people who are doing this work and also to acknowledge that uh, we have a lot of people both in the community and also in the organization who are supportive of the city's decision to lead with an equity focus. So with that, I'll turn it over to Maureen and Jennifer who will uh, give the legal presentation. Good evening, um, I'm Jennifer Cross. I am one of the prosecutors with the Bloomington Legal Department um, and Ms. O'Brien is here as well. Hello. <laughs> and um, we are here to give you an update just as everyone else did. Um, as way of background, uh, the members for the city's uh, legal REIT include the city attorney, our deputy city attorney in the criminal division. Um, myself, I'm the assistant city attorney in the criminal division. Uh, Ms. Maureen O'Brien is the assistant city attorney in the civil division, and we also have our crime victim liaison as a member. So for our accomplishments for 2021 to 2022, we really focused on embedded equity and service and providing proactive connections to our community. Uh, we started a restorative court program. Uh, this is a dedicated court in Hennepin County for Bloomington criminal defendants. Uh, it was a lot of work to get this off the ground. Our hearings on this court calendar started June 1st of 2022. So we just began them this month. We are very excited to see where this goes. We'll provide a little more background about what that court is and what it does and what we hope to see. Uh, we also have expanded our partnership with the Justice Point Diversion Program. Um, I believe that you have some handouts in front of you with regard to information about the services that Justice Point provides. Justice Point is a diversionary program <clears throat> that a defendant can choose to participate in in certain criminal cases. If they choose to uh, resolve their case in this way, they will meet with the uh, intake coordinator who develops a plan specific for that person. There is no prescribed course for people generally, but we really have them focus on what brought that individual into the criminal justice system and what can we provide to prevent them coming back. Uh, they meet with that uh, coordinator, develop that plan at the close of a year, assuming they have not been charged with any new criminal cases and complete the program, then their case um, is dismissed and um, there's no plea. That's the current um, set of diversion that we work with with Justice Point. It is only a $25 cost to the participants. This is a really important piece because the Justice Point program used to cost our participants a lot more money. Um, this created a disparity of access. Uh, as you may guess, some of our criminal activity is based in economic circumstances. And so with a high cost barrier, uh, it filters out a lot of people who could really benefit from this diversion program. We have also worked on uh, translating our documents that we use frequently into multiple languages. Our criminal um, crime victim liaison is tasked with sending out a letter to each and every victim of a crime prosecuted by the city of Bloomington. Um, these, of course, were drafted initially in English, and we have worked on having them translated into Hmong, Mandarin, Russian, Somali, Spanish, and Vietnamese. Uh, when they are able to be received by someone in their native language, it makes the court system more accessible and increases participation. As was previously mentioned, uh, we have worked with the Just Deeds Partnership. Uh, the HRA uh, racial covenants have been discharged. The Private uh, racial covenants are being handled by Larkin, and the city is looking forward to potentially using an extern to assist us in discharging the racially uh, racial covenants on city-owned properties. And finally, um, Ms. O'Brien will be presenting to you in the future, I believe, in conjunction with finance about our, her work in the equitable contracting micro-business development. So as I mentioned, our restorative court is a huge point of pride for our REIT. Uh, its mission is to employ a holistic justice model 
to restore individuals to good health and promote law-abiding behavior. So in this court model, what happens is a person comes to court and is identified by their attorney as someone who may be a good candidate for this court. Um, at that point, they are given a separate court date off of the regular criminal calendar and instead are referred into a calendar where there are social workers who staff that calendar and there's minimal um, participation from the judge. The individual person is paired up with a social worker who meets with them to determine what their needs are in areas like mental health, addiction, public assistance, healthcare, housing, and employment. They develop a plan with that social worker and the social worker helps direct them and walk them through um, accessing these services. They have check-ins uh, throughout the course of their case. The person comes back to that uh, different court model. Uh, the social worker reports in on their progress. And after they've made significant progress in those areas that were identified as goals, the social worker will recommend that they graduate from the court system. In consideration of what that person has done on, uh, with regard to all of these aspects of their lives, we will offer a significantly lighter sentence if that person is in fact sentenced or pleads guilty at all. Um, we, like I said, we just started this calendar. We worked uh, to, with the public defenders and the bench to get this up and running. Minneapolis also has a restorative court calendar and has noticed that they have had a statistically significant reduction in repeat crimes occurring from the individuals who participate in the restorative court program. And we are excited and look forward to seeing similar successes in the city of Bloomington. So let's look ahead to 2022 to 2023. It's really nice to be able to tell you all that we've accomplished a lot of great things, but we have to make sure that our accomplishments are doing what we set out to have them do. So we need to make sure that what we've developed is actually working to address racial equity concerns within the city of Bloomington. How are we going to go about this? Well, for example, what we are undertaking is a qualitative assessment of criminal case resolutions. What this means is looking at our criminal cases and seeing how we are resolving them. There's a number of ways that a criminal case can be resolved in the criminal justice system. Diversion is one of them. So we're actively tracking the number of cases that enter diversion. And we also would like to use race-based data from the court system in order to ensure that we are moving toward a more racially equitable resolution of cases. It is important to note that the court system is the holder of this race-based data, and so we are going to have to work to achieve access to that information in order to complete this assessment. It's also important to know that every single criminal case involves an individual person in unique factual circumstances, and may or may not also involve a victim who has their own unique impacts as a result of the crime. And so large statistical overviews, while useful, are only part of the story when we're evaluating how we handle criminal cases. Another goal we have is to ensure that we have continued funding for our 2021 accomplishments. Specifically, the Justice Point program was allowed to expand and operate a at a reduced cost level for its participants because Justice Point and Bloomington were able to work together to have Justice Point secure grant funding. Uh, the, as you well know, grant funding is a annual endeavor and so Justice Point is working on that. However, if they're unable to secure grant funding for the future, we will need to look to other sources of funding in order to be sure that we can continue offering diversionary options to the defendants in Bloomington. We look forward to connecting with the community. Um, as other um, REITs have mentioned, we want to increase our presence at local high schools. We want to offer mentorship and shadowing opportunities as well as internships and externships. 
And we also look forward to connecting with BIPOC bar associations in the legal community. Finally, um, we are excited to discharge racial covenants on city-owned properties and um, would, we would need an extern in order to facilitate that discharge. And with that, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. At this time, I will ask that we have our presenters come back to the podium, and I will turn it over to Activate and Carter and the council to uh, ask any questions that you may have. And Thank you. while they come to the podium, um, one other thing that I wanted to acknowledge is that each of our uh, racial equity action teams that are presented here today. In fact, all of our racial equity action teams have their department directors as members, and so they attend meetings and support the staff in doing this work. So thank you to Carla Henderson and Diane Kirby and uh, Melissa Vandershy. Uh, I'll thank you here tonight and the others later for supporting your teams and doing this great work. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Uh, so I guess I just want to, before I turn it over to the rest of the council for questions, I did want to just share a little bit of information for those who might be listening tonight at home or for those in the council chambers, just a little background about the racial equity work and where it's come from. And the fact that it really is, it does stem from many years of commitment and work from the city. So back in 2016, the city set diversity, equity, and inclusion as a strategic priority got involved in the GARE, the Government Alliance on Race and Equity. And then in 2019, Faith Jackson was hired, and I would say that probably helped really spur or build momentum for our work moving forward. Um, and then particularly when we uh, passed the Racial Equity Business Plan in 2020 and the REITs were created. And just to see the really incredible and powerful work that you all are doing, it, it's just, it's really amazing. I truly believe that we are leading the way across the country. Jamie, you know more than I do, so maybe not. I have no idea. No, we are. Um, and so just want to thank you all. I know that, as was mentioned at the beginning, this is work that goes above and beyond your day-to-day -day duties. And so just really appreciate your commitment and your persistence in, in doing this work. So with that, I will see if any of my fellow colleagues up here have any questions. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, uh, Acting Mayor. Um, so the community development folks, can you tell me more about that anti-displacement policy work, that sounds really interesting. It's just not something I'm familiar with. Yeah, so this is a relatively new endeavor for us. So we're still in that research and development um, process of it. But we're looking to a couple of different things, one of which is Richfield has a similar policy that we're looking to. So some adjacent communities have displace, anti-displacement policies or displacement policies. They're, the wording can kind of vary, and it depends on how you want to go about it. Some of it is proactive, some of it is reactive. And so that's what a lot of our team is working on right now to determine what is best for the city of Bloomington. There'll be some outreach, discovery of what's locally. There's also a lot of things that are happening countrywide. There's a lot of this going on in LA and Seattle. So looking to other real front runners to see where do we go with this, making sure that as we look at some big events and venues coming forward here in Bloomington that we don't see gentrification happening in our neighborhood nodes that are really crucial that can really much affect our BIPOC communities and small business owners. So we're kind of starting from this, you know, the beginning um, seeds of this all, but we want to make sure that we're taking a real thoughtful approach to it. Thank you. I look forward to hearing more about that. Um, and then community services folks, um, the, uh, the MESH program uh, how is that different than traditional uh, at home, <clears throat> excuse me, at home visiting programs and, um, I, or maybe it's not, but I, I it, it, how, how is that different? How would, what makes that, what makes it extended, for example? Yeah, so the MESH program is, um, it's a program where uh, families who voluntarily sign up for it, it usually lasts for about two years. Um, families who voluntarily sign off can sign out of that program at any time. So it's not like they're, com you know, their commitment that they're showing, if they are an understanding of it and they understand like the idea of the MESH program and they feel more comfortable with parenting, they can drop out of that program the moment they start to notice like, I'm okay. Um, it is relatively, there's a lot of similarities between other home visiting programs. I know before we started implementing the MESH program, we had uh, HFA, the Healthy Families America program. The difference is the, I, like, the duration of our visits and the topics that we cover. 
um, there was polls and studies that were shown about what topics are most important during the development of that child's life. Um, in the beginning, it's a lot about uh, teaching, about safety, especially new mothers, um, about you know breastfeeding, questions you may have about that, um, illnesses, things to watch out for, especially development, like what is normal, what is not normal. When you're a new mother, you don't really know. You have this little human being at home, and you're like, what do I do? Um, so for us to be able to, first of all, it's an honor for us to be, you know, be able to visit your home that you opened up to us and to walk you through that process up until two years, which is studied to show that those are the most vital years of development and that could really make, it or, uh, make or break uh, children. Um, so it's really all about focused, again, on development, uh, the development of the child and, and the programming specifically about like the topics that we choose that are more, most important. And then, of course, about like uh, bonding between the child and the mother as, you know, as, and the father, I mean, the whole family really. Um, and it's proven after you know implementing uh, this program for about six months, the changes that we're seeing um, with the families that are using the program. So yeah, uh, Mayor, if, if I could just if I could just say um, uh, if I could just add excellent uh, thing. The one other piece uh, of this of this program and it's uh, moving to it also is just the amount of mm -hmm. folks in the in the neighborhoods uh, out here in Bloomington that we can really service as well mm -hmm. um, by, by making this switch and you know you know no mayor that you know <laughs> when we heard this presentation we, we jumped at the opportunity for this so um, I just you know I, I, there's so much more uh, that we, we could cover with this but uh, one of the main pieces of this too is uh, just the breath in the uh, the ability of our staff to be able to to really give a direct service in a way that in the old model you just really couldn't do so Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's that's really helpful information. And I will I will say as the parent of a four year old that what do I do feeling? I don't <laughs> think it's gone away yet, and I don't think it will. Yeah. All right. Does anybody else, Councilmember Nelson? My kids are twenty one and eighteen. It doesn't go away. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, they're not watching. So. <laughs> Um, just a quick question for community development. There was a note that working with the uh, career counselors at Kennedy, are we also working with Jefferson and then the other middle schools also in Oak Grove? Yes, correct. So those are the ones that we've made direct contact with. A few of the schools have had some change in partnerships and leadership, so we're just kind of going with the flow. As COVID's changed, we haven't had the chance to really hone in on those in person, um, but absolutely that's our, that's our intent is to make sure that we have someone at every school here in Bloomington that we can make contact with. Great. I appreciate that. And then um, just a quick follow-up on that, if I might, Mayor. So um, the uh, have we had any inter interaction or engagement uh, with the school board or the school district leadership in terms of what they're doing um, and so we can coordinate those efforts? Not directly. We were trying to come at this as a wholehearted approach with other CD REIT, or excuse me, other REIT members so that the schools weren't having different REIT teams peppered in. So I know that our team that's working on education is trying to come at it as a collective unit so that we don't overwhelm them. I think that ultimately would be super helpful to have. I know there's also a shadowing program, I believe, for all of you that we are looking to kind of mirror um, in the future as well. So sometimes it's best to not recreate the wheel and kind of look to things that are already in place. So that is something that's on our agenda. And I think that our education team is hoping to meet with some other uh, REIT members as well so that we can come at it collectively. Okay. And I believe that one of our team is trying to help head that up. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And for the city manager, I might suggest we put that as a potential agenda item if we ever meet with the school board again. Mr. Mayor and Council Member, Mr. Mayor, <laughs> some habits die hard. Uh, acting Mayor uh, and Council Members, uh, the superintendent and I are trying to identify a date, and right now we're looking at September. Hopefully we'll be able to get a date on the calendar soon. No worries. Um, <laughs> just makes me feel better, or feel better about when I mess up. So, no. um, All right, anybody else? Council Member D'Alessandro. Thank you, Ms. Acting Mayor. Thank you, folks, for this um, first question. I want to know what the shirt's about. I love it. Oh, yes. So it's, it's kind of hidden, but we've got Heartbeat of the City, 
for those of you who have maybe heard our director, Carla Henderson, talk about how community development, as she likes to think, and as us as a team like to think, we really are the heartbeat of the city. So we're wearing it loud and proud today. We have some lovely people here in support. <laughs> and uh, there is CD Reed on the, bla- the back, but I wanted to keep the, the blazer to stay professional. Um, <laughs> We did represent. We're doing a little bit of a flex, but we're hoping to see this. We want to make sure that, that you know, our REIT work is at the front and center. And if that means getting some T-shirts going, by all means, that's what we want to do. So heartbeat of the city, right? Pre- appreciate the solidarity that yes. – absolutely. Wonderful. Uh, second question, if I may. Um, so uh, for the folks on the phone uh, around your restorative court, I uh, don't don't have any specific question, but I would love to, and I assume we can have this on a future agenda item, love to have you come back and give us a status report on how that's going. I think you mentioned that it was just since June 1st that it's been up and running, but um, obviously the metrics that um, Minneapolis is seeing are uh, positive, and I'd love to know if, uh, you know, we meet or exceed those expectations. So, um Thank you for your work on that. I know it was a heavy lift and appreciate the opportunity to um, to hear how that's going. Uh, I'd also love to get, if possible, a bit more of a deep dive on the on the MESH program at some point in the future. Uh, I, I think it's wonderful, and I wasn't on council when you all created that, but it sounds amazing. And is, if we can get a you know an end-of-year update or something like that on it, that would be great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Councilmember Lemon. Oh, I have all three quick questions here. So I see that they're interns, and I just uh, assume that they're paid? Yes. Okay. Yes, good. you do have paid internships. All right, great. That's That's excellent. the intent and goal. Great. Excellent. I was a paid intern, and that was always a great great experience here at the City of Bloomington. So, um, And then um, uh, I had the opportunity... Uh, uh, I think it was last Monday, we had a Just Deeds... Uh, uh, presentation uh, at the Rotary program, which I think was uh, just a fascinating uh, uh, kind of depiction of what's been going on there with that and what's been happening in Bloomington. So we did get a little bit of a uh, of an update in terms of what's happening there. And one of the questions that I thought was really interesting uh, that was asked at the point in time by one of the members that was there was, why is this important? And I think that staff uh, really did a, an excellent job of, of talking about, you know, why is this work in and of itself uh, uh, important that we are, are kind of uh, uh, diving into. Uh, we've seen it on many occasions where we've had uh, uh, before where uh, Faith Jackson's put forth uh, and said, hey, you know, here's what the demographics look like uh, in the city, and we are we are seeing changes, and we want to be proactive and, and be uh, be ready uh, for these changes and not kind of let it happen to us. And so I, I, I too, as one council member, want to thank you for your proactive uh proactive work in the things that you're doing here. These, these aren't easy uh, things to do, um, and people ask questions, and they're, and they're, they're pointed, and, and sometimes you, you kind of get discouraged, but I want to encourage you uh, to continue uh, uh, to do that work. And with that being said, I just had one last question, Mayor, um, with uh, uh, this displacement piece. Um, I, I've seen it work uh, a little bit in um, in Egan uh, when uh, there was some some uh, they wanted to redevelop an area. Uh, they really worked uh, with the businesses that were there and were able to try to find a different place for them to locate within uh, the city. And I, I just was always very. Um, uh, I thought that was great because I think it just, it, it uh, in a sense, kind of said, hey, you know what? You belong to this body of this, this city here in a sense like a heartbeat does, right? So <laughs> um, I know that was shameful. <laughs> um, but one, one of the questions that I had around that is how do these the cities, and we don't have to answer it all right now, how do they, how do they pay for that and maintain that uh, over time? You know, whenever you get something going, you want to be able to, you know, as important as that is to sustain that over time. That's kind of part of this research plan that we're working on right now. And a lot of that is a matter of whether we're going to come at this from a proactive uh, approach or a reactive approach, which kind of defines that displacement versus anti-displacement. There's a lot of people that are kind of reactive, and that probably is a little bit less funny, whereas if we're in a proactive approach, we are trying to create maybe a population list of, okay, we do want to redevelop this node in this neighborhood, but we want to make sure that we have attainable space for these small businesses that are already there. How do we make sure they're possibly on a top list? How do we make sure that they're important and they feel heard so that they're not just kicked out, but 
but that the community itself does want to see improvements in those areas. So trying to tackle both of those will take funds. I, am, I imagine that's going to be a combination of some funding that we'll have to do, some grant work that we'll probably have to do, similar to what we're working on with the Small Business Resource Center, um, and finding a way to make sure that that's fluid year in and year out. I'm hoping and I think that we'll see that there is a need for some of that proactive approach, but it does, it does create a little bit more of a need for higher funds and potentially more bodies and seats to figure out, well, how do we make sure we have a list of contacts for that and make sure that we make these businesses important? Okay, thank you. You know, I will also just add one comment that uh, that was something we heard in the Lindale Avenue retrofit um, listening process that, you know, people were excited about Lindale getting improved, but also worried about all of the small businesses that are located along Lindale. So really, Awesome work and excited to hear more about that as your research moves forward. So with that, I think we will move to our next agenda item. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. So our next So our next uh, agenda on our next item on our agenda is our consent business, and Councilmember Coulter has the uh, consent agenda. Thank you, Mayor, I do indeed. I have not heard of any holds from anyone, and I'm looking around to confirm that statement, and... Could, could, I, uh, could I hold 3.7? Because uh, I always don't want to miss an opportunity either for yourself or for myself to ask a question about how we use salt in Bloomington. I know it's the wrong time of year, but why not? All right. I mean, it's never, never too early to talk about ice on the roads in Minnesota. Um, so that being the case, oh, I, I have a, a point of order question, if I may. Um, I see a typo in 310, and I didn't know whether or not that is cause for a, a hold. Thank you for the question, and it does not sound like it is. Councilmember de Lissandro, is it the item that we talked about? Yeah, no, I'm fine with it. Thank you, though. Thank you. Okay. That being said, I'm going to hold uh, 3.2 since that is a donation to the city. Um, so I will move items 3.1, 3.3 through 3.6, and 3.8 through 3.12. Second. So we have a motion by Council Member um, Coulter. Had my my freeze there for a second. And second by Council Member Lohman. No further discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. I didn't, I just realized that I did not say aye. Okay. Aye. All right. So we will go to 3.7. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I held that uh, not because I had a problem uh, at all with, with, with salt being purchased. In fact, I'm quite in favor of, of having salt being purchased <laughs> within the city. Um, but I, I think there's some things that our city does. Um, uh, we just got back uh, uh, from getting uh, all all five steps of the Green Step cities and want to give us an opportunity to talk about how we're being sustainable uh, with uh, our salt program. So Acting Mayor, uh, Council Member, Council Member Lohman, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I think what you're speaking to is uh, our anti-icing program and kind of our attitude about salt usage. I mean, I think as we all know, we like to use salt in the winter because we like our roads to be as safe as possible. That's the good side of salt. The bad side of salt is that it's probably one of the biggest contaminants we have in our water bodies. And we have a total maximum daily load limit, a TDML on Nine Mile Creek, which is a chloride one, which is re directly related to salt. So we're very active in trying to figure out how do we reduce the amount of salt that we use and still have safe roadways. So I think as you've seen for many years, uh, we're, we're kind of changing our technologies. You're seeing much more of the roadway striping. Uh, that's anti-icing and pre-wetting of, of the roadway. Again, the idea is that if you put that material down at the right time, you will use in the end much less salt. And so we track very tightly the amount of salt we use and exactly where we put it. So we try to minimize it in areas that are near lakes and, and our storm sewer systems that are direct inputs to Nine Mile Creek and to lakes. Um, and we also try to anticipate weather events by, by good forecasting and to do that anti-icing work uh, before we actually do that, that uh, 
the plowing in, in and of itself. So it's kind of anticipating those things. Uh, we're kind of proud of that work, and, uh, and we've won several awards from the Salt Institute and from the Freshwater Society. And so uh, um, if you were to talk to some of our, uh, the folks in our, in our maintenance division, they're, they're somewhat geeky about, uh, about their mixing of these salt mixtures and, and how well they work. It's kind of a dangerous thing at some point because if you put it down the wrong mixture when it's too cold, you can actually make a, a skating rink on the roadway. And so they're, they're very careful about that and, uh, and watch it extremely carefully uh, throughout, throughout the winter. Any other questions, Councilmember D'Alessandro? Well, it's on the thing. I, I'm just kind of curious. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. Um, how is this? Is this our um, our salt load for a year, or how much salt is it that we're purchasing, and how long does it last? This is hopefully this is the salt load for the year. Okay. Uh, we have to put an order in uh, earlier in the in the the spring for it, and this is actually awarding it, um, and we are kind of guaranteed this amount. Um, we may, if we don't use this, we'll we'll have a give back a little bit. But this is the maximum amount that we can use in a year. And is that um, is that typical that we buy it year over year? We don't have a place to store it year over year. That is correct. We buy it year over year. We do store the bulk of it for a given season in our salt shed, which is just north of the public works facility off of 94th Street. Uh, can hold a great deal of of salt. And you'll note that there's kind of two types of salt we buy. Uh, we treated salt, that's kind of the green stuff you see in trucks, and again, that is treated to work more efficiently at, at lower temperatures, and so it uses less total salt. And then the regular salt we use primarily for mixing that uh, anti-icing material that we put down as a liquid. Uh, one final question, if I may. Um, is there any economic benefit to buying more? Is there any kind of, you know, does the price fluctuate, and are we in, like, surplus you know, kind of situ situations. I'm just wondering if we ever consider that or if it doesn't really materially make a difference. I don't know if it actually makes a material difference. And I think the way this, the salt distribution in the, in the state is set up when we buy this off the state contract is that typically uh, there's kind of one reckoning for salt use each year and, and kind of our maximums are set. So um, traditionally, I think in most communities, they're, they're, it's purchased once a year. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Keel. <clears throat> With that... Councilmember Lohman? Yeah, well, I figure since we're during hot seasons of our time, this maybe give us a little uh, cool off here. So with that being said, I'll go ahead and uh, move approval of purchase of up to 800 tons of regular road salt at a cost of 76.19 per ton under State of Minnesota contract number 177613 from Compass Materials America Incorporated and up to 3,200 tons of treated road salt at a cost of $104 uh, dollars, uh, per ton under State of Minnesota contract uh, 1776.10 from Cargill Incorporated. Second. So we have a motion by Councilmember Lohman and a second by Councilmember D'Alessandro with no further discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. So with that, we will move on to item 3.2. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And just quickly before we get to this, a procedural question. Since uh, this has been pulled from consent, I see it's two motions. Do we have to take those as two separate motions? Uh, <clears throat> acting Mayor and Council Members, I would prefer that you do that. Okay. Thank you. Just wanted to clarify that on the front end. So um, I just wanted to to pull this. This is a um, the donations this evening, and we received... Uh, last October, a very generous uh, donation from Susan and Larry Hassler uh, with regards to the purchase of a new uh, canine unit for our Bloomington Police Department. And we uh, received as well um, a donation from the United States Police Canine Association Region 18 um, to fund the, the canine training. And so I just wanted to uh, call that out and, and uh, thank the Hasslers for their, their very generous contribution to our department. I assume uh, this is last October. I assume staff has or will uh, send appropriate thank yous. Um, but uh, just again, very, very grateful for uh, the support of the, the community and, and for that donation. So um, unless anyone has anything further to add, I will go ahead and we'll take the first one. Uh, move 
to adopt a resolution uh, accepting donations as listed. Second. So we have a motion by Council Member Coulter and a second by Council Member Lohman. With no further discussion on this, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Uh, Mayor, I will move to approve uh, the budget adjustment uh, in, a, in the resolution uh, to move uh, $15,500 $15, from the general fund to the police special revenue grants and projects fund for the canine unit. Second. So you have a motion by Council Member Coulter and a second by Council Member Lohman. With no further discussion on this, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. All right, so with that, we are through our consent business, and we are moving to our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances. So let me find the motion that I need to make. Uh, so I would like to make a motion to hold open and continue to hold open until July 11th, 2022, public hearings regarding ordinances amending City Charter Section 2.03, Section 3.01, and Section 4.06. Second. All right, so... Go ahead. Sorry, Mayor. Sorry, I just, um, just to, to clarify for the public, because this is now the second time we've had to continue. Um, these are votes related to amending the city charter, which require a unanimous seven votes of the city council. And obviously, we don't have seven votes on the city council present tonight. So that's why we are continuing the, again, these again. Just wanted to Thank you. clarify yes. that for, th for the uh, folks watching at home. Thank you for clarifying that, Councilmember Coulter. Uh, City Manager, did you want to make any comments or? Uh, Acting Mayor is going to make the exact same point as Council Member Coulter and our City Attorney has her microphone turned on, I imagine, to make a very similar point. So we're, we're all singing the same song up here. <laughs> what Mayor members, I, our Acting Mayor members, I would like to strongly encourage everyone to be here at the July <laughs> meeting. <laughs> because if not, we have to start over again. The whole thing. So... Yeah, so let's all be here. <laughs> all right, so so nobody can get COVID. Okay, sounds good. All right, so with that, I made the motion. And Council Member Lohman, did you second? All right, thank you. So with no further discussion on this, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. All right, so that moves us to item 4.4, the public hearing on the partial vacation of Lindau Lane. Good evening, um, Council. This is a fairly straightforward vacation for that you've seen previously. This one's a little unique in the fact that it is in three dimensions. You normally you see it in two dimensions, and so we're we're asking tonight is to vacate the footings, stem walls, and bridge structure over Lindau Lane in order to facilitate the Mall of America future water park and construction on top of the existing bridge structure. Thank you, Ms. Long. Is that everything? Okay. Uh, so do I open the public hearing now? No. Okay. See if there are any questions. Any questions before we open the public hearing? Okay, I see no questions. So with that, we will open the public hearing. Is there anybody in the chambers who would like to make a comment during this public hearing related to item 4.4? I am not seeing anybody. Is there anybody on the phone? Uh, acting mayor, there's no one on the phone. Okay. So with that, would anybody like to make a motion to close the public hearing? Mayor, I'd be happy to make that motion to close the public hearing. Second. <clears throat> All right. So Councilmember Lohman has made the motion to close the public hearing, and Councilmember Martin has second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries 6 -0. All right. So. Any other discussion, questions? Okay. Councilmember Nelson. Uh, I mean, Martin. That works Sorry. too. Uh, Mayor, I am. Uh, <laughs> you know what? This is a long one. I make. am now assigning. <laughs> or I'm happy to make the motion, Mayor. Uh, Mayor, I will move that in the interest of the public to adopt an ordinance approving the partial vacation of Lindau Lane. Uh, East 81st Street, as dedicated in the plats of Airport South Edition, Mall of America, Mall of America 5th Edition, and Mall of America 8th Edition, according to the recorded plats there of Hennepin County, Minnesota. 
Second. All right, so we have a motion by Council Member Martin and a second by Council Member D'Alessandro. With no further discussion on this, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. All right, great. So that ends the section of our agenda on hearings, resolutions, and ordinances. And we did amend the agenda at the beginning of the meeting. And so we are going to first um, uh, have a discussion presentation on the special assessment policy updates. And we do have a public comment period that we are going to open up after your presentation. Great. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Acting Mayor, Council members. Um, I'm before you this evening to discuss our special assessment policy and some updates or proposed updates to it. Um, just for a little background, the city's special assessment policy has been in place since 1962. Um, the last update we did to this was in 2014. Um, so we do update it um, from time to time, and this is one of those times. Um, so kind of some background on the proposed updates and how they came to be. Um, when we came before you in the fall of 2021 with our pre preliminary street listing for our 2022 PMP reconstruct project, um, Lindale Avenue, a segment of Lindale Avenue from 106th Street to the South Terminus was originally included in the uh, street listing. Um, and as part of that, we noticed all of the properties that uh, were, uh, that, uh, that abutted that roadway and uh, informed them of the potential project. And also we provided them an estimated assessment at that time um, per uh, state statute for our special assessments. Um, when we were calculating those, those special assessments or estimated assessments, uh, it became clear to staff that we did not have the methodology in place in our current policy to accurately, accurately reflect the assessments for uh, properties within the Bluffs on Sands Pierre neighborhood. Um, this was a little, this was an interesting or unique situation where we had a private road um, that was serving the neighborhood that had access onto the public roadway. However, the private road um, was its own parcel. There wasn't an underlying parent parcel like we would see normally with a large townhome development or other um, high density housing. So we didn't have the correct tools in place to be able to uh, accurately provide um, an estimated assessment. So that resulted in varying assessments for properties that were, a very, that were very similar. So one thing that we had in our policy was we addressed uh, one and two family homes and we addressed fourplexes and larger developments there was a gap in those triplexes or three family homes. So within the Bluffs on Sands Pierre community, um, there are very similar homes that may be part of a triplex and a duplex, and they received varying uh, special assessment, uh, estimated special assessments, which caused many questions, which we knew um, going into the process. So uh, when we met with them last fall, we told them that if their street is considered or is ordered for the project, that changes will be made to the special assessment policy prior to the final assessments being sent out. Um, ultimately, that section of Lindale Avenue was removed from the 2022 PMP project um, due to some uh, consolidation with some uh, potential projects at the bottom of the Lindale Avenue down at the river bottoms there. Um, but we still wanted to move forward with the uh, changes or the updates to the special assessment policy. So when that segment does come back up, um, that we have the tools in place to accurately reflect the assessments um, for those particular properties. So um, what we did is that following the ordering of the project for the 2022 PMP, uh, staff went back and worked on some, uh, some different uh, ways of calculating the assessments for those properties and kind of brainstormed those. Um, following those, that work, we met with representatives from the Bluff Sun Sands Pier community and presented those kind of alternatives. At that point, we had kind of narrowed it down to three alternatives, which we'll share with you here in a second, um, and met with the neighborhood and got their feedback on, went through kind of the, the methodology between each of them and ask them to give us some feedback as well. So we had a very constructive conversation in March with the representatives in the neighborhood. Um, since then, uh, the neighborhood representatives went back to the entire neighborhood and received feedback on the proposed uh, methodology that the city provided them. And that email was included in your, in your attachments here this evening. Um, and they had a uh, pretty, um, uh, uh, it was a consistent, uh, request or a consistent uh, response to the policies that we had in place. Um, one, one methodology definitely came out above all the other ones here, which I'll go into in a second. So um, with that, um, let's talk first about the first proposed change would be the land use definition update. So this is what I was kind of referring to previously. Um, our current policy says single and two family does not address three family. So we are recommending to add this three family here. So single, two, and three family or triplex units would be assessed at that same 25% rate. So it really just cleans up that gap that we currently had in our policy. So now we have single through three family and then fourplexes and on are addressed. So we don't have that, that, uh, that gap that we currently have right now. And by doing this, this would, for the uh, Bluffs on Sands Pier community in particular, this would um, 
treat all the properties within, uh, within that community um, at the same rate. So um, again, wanted to be consistent with how we apply our methodology to similar properties. So the next thing we looked at was the adjusted front footage calculation options, or the AFF options. Uh, next slide, please. And we looked at three different options for this. Again, we want a methodology that reflects the actual special benefit that these properties would receive from any particular project. So we, that, we kind of looked at what we have currently in place in our policy and tried to mirror that to see what we could best fit or, or modify to make uh, work for situations such as the Bluffs and Sands Pier uh, neighborhood. Um, so the first option we proposed would be a single assessment. So this was uh, created by, by creating a parent parcel. So there's not a current parent parcel right now. When I say parent parcel, what I mean, um, and I'll show on my next slide here in a second, is an underlying parcel that we calculated an AFF off of. So in the case of the Bluffs and Sands Pier community, we don't have that, so it's, it makes it unique. So this option would create a pseudo parent parcel um, that we would use to calculate the AFF, and then from that, calculate a total assessment for the association. Um, and then uh, with option A, what we would do is we would just assess the homeowners association that entire amount. So they would get one bill, so it would encumber one of the parcels within that homeowners association, and then they would have the ability to decide how that is split amongst all their members. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. So this uh, slide here, it shows the calculation of how that AFF is calculated. So you can see here, the blue represents, there's 63 parcels in the Bluffs and Sands Pier community. So, um, taking that outline of all 63, uh, this blue represents, if we were to say this is just one large parcel. And then from that, we use our tools already in place to adjust to calculate our frontages. So um, that's what is being displayed here. On the bottom in the orange there, that is a scenic uh, easement. So there's no development in there. So that's not included in that area calculation when we go through and calculate our AFFs, which I you know, describe every fall when I meet with everyone here. Um, so you can see we have two frontages there, and then we would use that for those frontages multiplied by the rate of the improvement to calculate a total assessment for the whole neighborhood, and then we would apply that in option A, that total assessment would be sent to the neighborhood association, and then they could decide how it was split amongst their members. Uh, next slide, please. So option B is similar. Again, we take that overall parent parcel concept, um, establish that AFF, establish that total assessment, but in this option, um, the assessments would be split evenly amongst all the parcels. So um, we would take the total amount uh, divided by the number of parcels. In the case of the Bluffs and Sands Pier community, that's 63 parcels. And each individual property owner would receive a bill um, in that exact amount, so to equal that total assessment for the overall parcel. Um, so this option, each individual homeowner or parcel owner would have an assessment, and they could decide if they wanted to pay it in full. Um, have it spread out over 10 years or prepay with no interest applied. So it would give the flexibility to each individual property owner how they wanted to deal with their assessment. Um, next slide, please. And the third option would be, again, taking that overall parent parcel concept um, and, and, and establishing that total assessment for the neighborhood. But this one would be a little different is where we would actually divide the assessments for the individual parcels based on the individual AFFs of each parcel. So um, if you go to the next slide, I can show you. So we have, this is an example. This is an individual parcel within the Bluffs on Sands Pier community, one of the 63 parcels. Um, Lindale Bluffs Trail is the private roadway. Um, our current policy, though, says if we want to establish the AFF for an individual property, we can do that using the private roadway. Um, and that's what you see here. So for instance, this parcel has a frontage of 66. So if option C, what we would do is we would take the individual AFFs of all the parcels involved in the Bluffs area and then for this particular parcel would pay their percentage of that total overall AFF. So this, uh, the bills would be subject to the actual area of the AFF of each parcel. So in this case, the parcel to the south there, you can see that's a smaller area. That parcel would receive a smaller bill than the parcel to the north. So they would fluctuate a little bit. So some of the larger parcels would see a larger assessment. Some of the smaller parcels would see a smaller assessment. But the total dollars um, assessed for the neighborhood would remain the same in option C. Um, and with that, we took these, all these options to the, like I said, we presented these to the Bluffs on Sands Pier representatives in March. They took them back to their members. Um, they came back and their option was option B, overwhelmingly from the neighborhood that they received feedback from. And that is the option where the assessment, the total assessment is split evenly amongst all the parcels within the uh, association. And that's uh, staff's recommendation as well. So the two proposed changes that we have that are reflected in the uh, policy, uh, uh, materials that were included in your uh, council items this evening. It was one, to include the three family land use 
um, in our definition so that we clean up that gap I mentioned earlier. The second would be to add a new AFF calculation, which is highlighted again in the attachment, um, that would address the single and two-family um, lots, or uh, yes, excuse me, single and two-family lots within a homeowners association served by a private roadway, such as the Bluffs on Sands Pier neighborhood. And with that, uh, we do have a recommended action, and I'm happy to take any questions um, on any of those items. Thank you, Mr. Hansen. Questions, Councilmember Lemon. Yeah, well. Before I get started, Mayor, I just want to say uh, thank you uh, to the staff um, uh, for the work that was done. This was <laughs> no small undertaking uh, uh, to do this, and I, we just want to thank you for the hard work that went into this. So much appreciated. So I have, did have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, one is just to clarify with the recommended plan, would the assessments go uh, directly to the homeowners, or is that still going to be, um, I know at one point it was going to be sent to the, uh, you know, the homeowners uh, place and then backed out. So could you help clarify? Abs absolutely, Acting Mayor, uh, Councilmember Lohman. The assessments would be sent to each individual parcel. So yes, we would send out 63 assessment notices to each individual parcel um, for the determined amount, correct? And then um, there was another, uh, just for clarification, um, it, it looked like when I looked at the map for the assessment that it went to the bluffs. But there was some understanding from some of the residents that were there that it actually, the assessment went all the way down to the end of the dock or to the end of the road uh, of Lindale there. Could you help clarify that in terms of um, where that assessment kind of goes uh, for, for the property? So the assessments would be based, uh, if, you would, if, we, actually, if you can go back to the slide of the overall. Thank you. So for, for, the, for this uh, particular neighborhood, for the Bluffs neighborhood, the assessments would be based on that blue shape right there. So it's the area um, of the, all of the parcels within the Bluffs on Sands Pierre neighborhood minus that uh, scenic overlook or scenic uh, easement on the south side because we don't include those. That's not uh, developable, so that's not included in our calculations for our AFF. So that's what the total uh, the total assessment amount would be based on. Thanks for uh, clarifying that um, uh, in terms of where that is. And then the last uh, kind of question that I had. Um, was there were some funds that my understanding was that were available. Um, I know that during the conversation when this uh, had come forward, uh, there was this question in terms of, uh, you know, why aren't those funds available to be utilized to reduce the, uh, you know, the, the assessment here because, you know, that was in this area. So just uh, help me understand that as a, as a council member and, and those folks who are you know, watching from home trying to understand, you know, why, why aren't we getting a cut of that? Or maybe they are getting a cut of that. Help, help me understand what, what's happening with that. Absolutely. Uh, Acting Mayor, Council Member Lohman, the funds you're, you're, you're speaking of are the funds that we received from Ames Construction during the construction of the 35W Bridge uh, for wear and tear on Lindale Avenue. And we have, those funds have been set aside and are earmarked to be used when this segment of Lindale Avenue is reconstructed. So those funds will be applied to the surfacing uh, uh, cost and, and subtracted from that before we actually calculate the assessment. So when the Lindale Avenue segment um, from 106 South is reconstructed, those funds will be applied. So the total cost of that improvement will be subtracted by the funds, um, those funds approximately $185,000 to lower the rate, overall rate for everyone that's included that has an assessment for a servicing improvement during that year. So we don't have individual rates for each individual street segment. We have a rate for the entire project for that year. So those funds are being held and will be applied to the year that the Lindale Avenue segment will be applied. So they will be seeing some reduction from that. Okay, so my understanding then, so right now, the assessment right now is 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 not for uh, Lindale right now. This is just for uh, this area, right? Just help me understand that, because I think that, that what folks are understanding is none of those funds are gonna be applied uh, to the assessment at all. I mean, obviously right now, because they're not looking at, at right. Lindale, but so, Help clarify that. If yep. You could. So there's no; those funds are not being utilized this year. So what before you this evening is the the calculation of the methodology that we would use when this neighborhood is subject to an assessment. So when Lindale Avenue, um, adjacent to their properties, is reconstructed, the changes in the in our policy tonight would help us with our methodology when we calculate those. And then those funds that you mentioned, those would be applied when this segment is is constructed, and that would be subtracted from the overall surfacing cost. So they would see a reduction in their actual rate when it's calculated based on the, the total AFF of all the properties included in the, in the project of that year. All right, Councilmember D'Alessandro and then Councilmember Nelson. 
I, I thank you, Acting Mayor. Hello, how are you? Good evening. Uh, I, I just had one question for clarification here on the email that was sent by Mr. Mueller indicates that they've received they received 35 responses with 31 preferring option A and four preferring option B, but you kept referring to option B, so I just wanted to make sure I understood. At some point, option A became option B or something Correct. happened. Correct, I apologize for the confusion. Yes, no, that's, that's okay. a good point of clarification. So when we met with them in, uh, in March, excuse me, um, we had different uh, lettering as far as the different options. So option B on the email was referring to the slides we provided to them during our neighborhood meeting, which differed from this, so I apologize for the confusion. But that was, yes, that's a good clarification. Thank you for that. Thank you. Councilmember Nelson? Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you, Mayor. Um, Mike, I got two quick questions for you. Uh, first one is, uh, from staff's point of view, do the outcomes of using this method seem to be consistent with how other properties throughout the city are assessed? I know it's not going to be exact, but do, do they seem reasonable? They do. And looking at the total cost, um, the total dollar value, I mean, using the rates that we provided for the estimated assessments for 2021, um, the total value or the total assessment amount for the neighborhood using this methodology would reduce it by um, almost two thirds of what they would have been assessed with the original policy. And I think that's important because the original policy assessment, I, in my professional opinion, there's the special benefit analysis, which we do. So regardless, after we, we calculate our assessments, we do our special benefit analysis, and they'll actually go out and we'll say, we look at this neighborhood and tell us if our, if our assessment calculations are in line with the benefit these properties receive from the project. And um, using our current policy, I, there's no way, based on what we've seen before, that we'd be able to justify that, so which means we would be, before you ask them to adjust those assessment amounts down. With this new policy, I see those more in line, looking at about 1,500 per, per unit. That's more in line with what we've seen for other similar developments, you know, uh, townhomes, other you know, higher density developments. So I would assume that that would be, or be comfortable more with that number. And again, we would check that against our, uh, special, our special benefit analysis and make sure that those numbers are in line. Okay, thank you. And then um, my last question uh, was regarding what uh, Council Member Lowman was talking about, the money from Ames. Yeah. Is that, are there any other properties impacted by the part of uh, Lindale that will be done with the Ames money or that has to be done because of that? Uh, Acting Mayor, Council Member. So again, the Ames money would be applied. There'll be a total dollar value for all the servicing costs for the, the reconstruction project the year that Lindale Avenue segment is included. So the way that would be applied is there'll be a total cost for that work. We will subtract the Ames money from that total cost, so we'll have a new total cost, and then from that we will calculate our rates, so our 25% rate and 50% rate. So they're going to see a savings of the total cost value is going to go down. So what we actually calculate the assessment rates on will be that lower number. So yes, the year that that segment is applied, those funds will be applied, but again, we don't have individual rates for each individual street segment, so it'll be applied to every person that's subject to a surfacing assessment for that particular year that the Lindale Avenue segment is, is constructed. So, and we can talk about this more, but that is a little bit of a concern because it's my understanding that this, that that road reconstruction is limited to this neighborhood and it seems like everyone that's getting assessed in that year will get a discount, um, not just this neighborhood or not just the parcels that are impacted by that, um, if that makes sense. And I, I think maybe that's what you were kind of getting to, and I think maybe some of the homeowners are like, if that money was for this part of it, and you know, then it should go to those homeowners that are adjacent to it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if there's a mechanism to do that instead of spreading it across all of the property owners that are in that particular year. Um, I mean, I guess maybe that's a question for the city manager if, if it could be just applied to the assessment amounts for any properties that are directly impacted by that section. Mr. Bree. <laughs> Councilmember Nelson, can you ask it one more time? Yeah. Just Is it possible instead of reducing the overall mm -hmm. cost and then saving everybody that year money to reduce the assessments of those properties that are adjacent to whatever work they agreed to pay for? And, and this is specific to the Lindale Avenue and how the Ames funds yep. get applied. Yep. Yep. And I think the issue here is, and I'll look to Brian to clarify this a little bit more, is whenever we receive a deposit like that, we don't allocate specifically for 
um, a stretch like this. It just sort of goes into the larger project fund. So it'd be a little bit of a deviation from past practice to do that. Is that accurate, yeah. Ryan? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, City Manager. And I think another thing to think about too is when you think about that is that we do receive other, other funding sources that go towards, you know, for a year we may have some street segments that are part of a state aid funding that we have state aid funds for. We may have a residential street. So overall, the, the, the value is being passed along to all the residents in Bloomington. So and that's kind of common for, you know, other funding sources that we have for other years as well. Okay. Well, I just want to make sure we're clear on that. That's how that works. So yeah. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hansen. And again, just want to reiterate what you said previously. That specific decision is not what we're deciding tonight. Correct. We're really talking about the policy language for a special assessment that then will be applied to all properties that are relevant across the city. So we'll be revisiting this discussion specifically at a later date. Correct, uh, Acting Mayor. When now, uh, yeah, when the Lindale Avenue segment is is uh, scheduled or on the uh, be considered for the reconstruct project, yes, that conversation will be having again. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Council Member D'Alessandro? Thank you, Acting Mayor. Just one quick clarification. Define the act, the Lindale segment, just for everybody's edification. Is it 98th Street all the way back to the block? No, I should, I'm sorry. It's 106th Street south to the term, the south terminus or the boat launch. At the okay, end. so that's that's an in, that's the whole segment. Correct. And and how many properties outside of the bluffs? Uh, that were the, the, of St. Pierre that we're talking about. How many other properties exist in that segment off the top of your head? Um, I'm thinking one, two, three, uh, roughly, I would, I think maybe 10 more parcels, give or take okay. 10 to 12 parcels, I think, um, along that segment. Okay. Just off the top of my head, somewhere in that range. That's okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. That's it. Yep. And, th and those are commercial properties uh, for the most part, right? Commercial, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And there's also a U.S. Fish and Wildlife right. and some other properties. So, right. yes, exactly. This is the only residential properties. Single, single, two and three family properties are the bluffs on Sands Pier Neighborhood on that segment. Okay, Council Member Lohman. Thank you. Um, I know that we're not talking about you know the Ames money right now. However, if we wait till it's time to have the conversation, there wouldn't be enough time, my understanding, for staff to even look to see if there was another way to to, to do that assessment. While I'm loath to try to right while you're right in the middle of of a process. Uh, to to change that that change that process, so I want to be careful that you know what, what I'm asking. But um, I would like to know uh, if we were to try to um, redirect that money in some other way, um, what it would take to kind of do that do that research. Um, if other cities are doing that, uh, um, I don't know if it makes sense to to, to send all that money uh, to them, uh, given that. You know, we do a 25%, and then seven, the city covers the other 75%. Um, and so um, so I, I am curious about that in terms of a research standpoint. So I don't want to get to uh, when we get ready to have that conversation, and at that point, we're pretty much we're going to assess that. We're not going to be able to change at that point. So let me throw that back out and just ask that question. Is, is that something that can be researched relatively quickly, or could we have that discussion now or have staff look into it um, now? Acting Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Lohman, I would request that if that's a conversation the council wants to have, that's a policy discussion that needs to be further fleshed out again to Brian's point earlier that when we receive uh, contributions, whether it's uh, MSA funds or in this case uh, uh, an agreement for funds to be contributed as an offset of other things, those funds are counted in the aggregate um, because the city is paying for the costs of these projects as well. The special assessments cover a portion of the costs. All other funds pay for a portion of costs and that's for the benefit of all taxpayers in Bloomington. So essentially by dedicating a certain amount of funds to a certain project uh, lowers the benefit of all other taxpayers in Bloomington. So if council is interested in having a conversation about how we treat certain deposits or uh, negotiated contributions, I think that that's one we'd like to bring back to you. Uh, and we can certainly do that prior to the, the uh, next point in time when we're going to bring back the, the whole project for discussion. But that's not one that we can resolve tonight. Obviously not tonight. And I, I just I thank you for that. I just the only reason why I, I kind of pushed on it, I know that was one of the, the requests uh, that this neighborhood have had. Um, and so I want to make sure that doesn't get lost in the conversation. Now, if there aren't enough council members tonight, uh, when we get to policy and issue update, uh, want to have that conversation, then I'll, I'll understand it won't move forward. But uh, I can wait to that point in time to bring that forward. 
Great. Are there any other questions before we open up the public comment? Okay, I'm not seeing any. So we will go ahead and open up the public comment. If there's anybody in the room who would like to speak to the council here, um, come on up and please state your name for the record. And before you walk away, just make sure you sign in on the paper. Will do. Uh, Madam Acting Mayor, uh, council members, uh, my name is Nathan Mueller, and uh, it will come as no surprise that I'm from the Lindell Bluffs neighborhood, um, or Bluffs on Sands Pier. Uh, so uh, there were three main points uh, that I wanted to be sure to address this evening. Uh, well, to begin with, let me uh, let me add my thanks to the city staff for for all the hard work that they did working with us. And Brian in particular was extraordinarily good to work with. Just just really terrific cooperative. So uh, very much appreciate that. Uh, it may surprise you that we don't agree 100% with every <laughs> everything that uh, is uh, currently in place. Uh, we The uh, community did absolutely endorse the option that is chosen and, and that is the uh, basis of the policy adjustment uh, proposed tonight. So um, on that matter, uh, we do agree. Uh, on the matter of Ames funding, um, uh, I, don't call me out of order just yet, but um, I, I will say that it is um, it is a strong perception, and, a, and a, uh, as I have sort of taken on the role of spokesperson for the uh, community in this regard, uh, my ear has been bent on multiple occasions about this topic. So it is a strongly held belief that since the funds were specifically for uh, compensation for the damage to that segment of street, that it would only be reasonable that they be used to reduce the cost to the city and to the neighborhood for the reconstruction of that street. And so to that extent, I would argue um, either an exception to the standing policy on that basis or a carve out in the policy to allow for that, uh, not in not just in this case, but in future similar circumstances. It, it strikes me that it's a it's perhaps unique in comparison to other funding sources that might present themselves. Uh, so I uh, I ask you on the behalf of our community, uh, please give that due consideration and uh, see if that policy can be adjusted. Uh, we did have a reservation uh, initially. We've been assured by city staff uh, that our homeowners association will not be required to collect uh, the special assessments. I want to go on the record as uh, understanding that, uh, uh, to be clear. Uh, and then I think the third thing, uh, third and last point, uh, the segment of Lindell Avenue that our neighborhood uh, utilizes and accesses is a very small portion of this project. And this is the other thing that our uh, homeowners uh, with great frequency uh, comment about. Uh, Council Member Lohman, I think you've heard this on a few occasions yourself. Uh, I have, uh, I have uh, well, I want to thank the city for my education about special assessments. I, I've learned a lot of, about that. If you want me to give a session for you at some point, I could do that. Um, but uh, I think the... Um, the perception is that the assessment is still excessive. Uh, uh, what I have communicated to the homeowners, hopefully successfully, is that we understand this all comes out in the wash as we get to the uh, point of the uh, special uh, benefit that our homeowners receive. So I think we're um, in a stable, peaceful place at this point with the project. Um, I think we can be assured that our homeowners will probably want to challenge the um, the special benefit at the point that that's determined. And so just wanted to let you know that that's on the horizon for us when the project does come up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mueller. Is there anybody else in the chamber who would like to speak during this public comment period? Is there anybody on the phone? Uh, Madam Acting Mayor, no one is on the phone. Okay. So last call, if there's anybody else in the chamber, if not, we will close the public comment for this item. All right. Seeing nobody. Are there any other additional questions? I mean, we didn't actually. 
officially, do we have to officially close the public? I don't think that we have to close the no. public hearing. So right. it's just okay. Yep. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments before we vote? Councilmember D'Alessandro. Just making sure, did I understand that the specific question is being tabled and we are about the Ames money is being tabled and we're going to talk about it in the business section of our meeting later tonight? Correct. That's my okay. understanding. I appreciate it. Thank the, you. The, the intent. The motions in front of us are not related to Understood. the Ames money. Understood. Yep. Thank you. Yes. Councilmember Lohman. Well, if uh, there aren't any other comments, I'd be happy to make a motion, Mayor. Mayor, I move to approve uh, the update to the City of Bloomington's general assessment policies. Do you have a second? Second. Oh. So we have a motion by Councilmember Lohman and a second by Councilmember D'Alessandro. With no further discussion on this item, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. All right. Thank you, everyone. So now, just cruising through this agenda, it's great. Uh, we are going to go to agenda item 5.1, which is the HRA assessment. Good evening. Good evening. Got the whole crew. Yeah. We are. One, we're the heartbeat. <laughs> uh, so, acting mayor, council members, we are here tonight to discuss development activities within the city of Bloomington, particularly within the community development department. We believe that our department strives to provide professional, prompt, and predictable service. What began as an assessment of the HRA in terms of what current resources are being used to deliver its mission and whether the HRA is meeting all of the, the development needs for the city of Bloomington quickly turned to the OHL, where we explored all its complexities, where that work is currently sitting and where it belongs. We then looked at the Port Authority and their work in South Loop and what it would mean to supersize their capacity across the entire city landscape, including creative placemaking into the neighborhoods. We then also asked if the city should explore the creation of an EDA. How do we better serve our small businesses through attraction, retention, and expansion? How do we focus on our neighborhood commercial nodes? Tonight, we want to share and discuss with you the recommendations that came out of the assessment of the HRA by an outside consultant and later tweaked by staff. We sincerely believe that what we are proposing aligns with our mission of cultivating an enduring and remarkable community where people want to be. It also aligns with our core values that transformation will come through collective courage and the willingness to take risks. And everyone benefits when there is equitable access to opportunity. So with myself, Carla Henderson, Director of Community Development, I have Erica Coleman, who is our HRA Administrator, Shane Rudlang, who is our Port Authority Administrator, and Glenn Markegaard, our Planning Manager. And that's our purpose of why we're here today. Erica? Thank you. So um, briefly, the HRA was statutorily created and with the purpose to provide a sufficient supply of adequate, safe, and sanitary dwellings in order to protect the health, safety, morals, and welfare of the citizens of Bloomington, to clear and redevelop blighted areas, to perform those duties according to the comprehensive plans, to remedy the shortage of housing for low and moderate income residents, and to redevelop blighted areas in situations in which private enterprise would not act without government participation or subsidies. Next slide. So how did we get here? Well, in November 2020, a new administrator was hired, i.e. me, in the middle of a pandemic. And so during that time, it was made evident that the pandemic has exacerbated the need to focus on housing navigation assistance, people experiencing homelessness and housing instability, and homeowner preservation, in addition 
to rental assistance and creation of housing opportunities. In March 2021, the HRA Board did adopt a strategic plan that aligns with the city's strategic priorities and identifies work along the whole housing continuum with a focus on operational efficiency. The HRA was established 51 years ago, June 14, 1971 to be exact, so we just came on 51 years, to serve the Bloomington community. However, the community has continued to grow in population and diversity. Therefore, an assessment conducted by an outside consultant was needed to determine if the HRA's mission and purpose have shifted over the years, how current resources are being used to deliver its mission, and whether the HRA is meeting all the development needs for the city of Bloomington. The mission of the HRA is to help provide affordable housing opportunities for those who are not adequately served by the marketplace, coordinate the city's efforts to preserve existing neighborhoods, and promote development and redevelopment that enhances Bloomington. In November 2021, Kirsten Chatfield LLC was selected. Kirsten Chatfield, principal, specializes in the facilitation and implementation of commercial, industrial, and mixed-use redevelopment and development projects for public and private organizations. They provide master planning, strategic planning, project management, public finance assistance, and development assessment services for small and large cities. Overall, Kirsten Chatfield LLC has worked with over 50 cities, 10 counties, and 35 private companies to meet their development objectives and specializes in economic development project implementation, tax increment financing, economic development authorities, loan and grant programs, and redevelopment assistance. Kirsten Chatfield herself has 30 years experience working in and with municipal government in economic development. In May of 2022, the assessment was finalized to address the overall question of, do we, how do we determine if the HRA's mission and purpose have shifted over the years? How current resources are being used to deliver its mission and whether the HRA is meeting all the development needs for the city of Bloomington. Next slide. So during the assessment, data collection was used, and it was done in two different types. Almost 30 documents were examined. Interviews were held with the HRA staff, as well as interviews were held with other city divisions and departments to assess how the HRA interacts with them. And interviews were held with the HRA and Port Authority board members to collect a comprehensive um, approach of information around data collection. Next slide. In the assessment, there were five areas that were yielded for improvement. Systems, programs, staffing levels, area of operation, as well as the use of outside consulting services. Next slide. There were key takeaways that were found in the assessment. There is no standard to track program impacts, staff involvement, or returns on investment. BIPOC, Black Indigenous People of Color, and seniors are our fastest growing populations yet underserved. Homeownership programs are limited in scope. The only focus has been on housing, not commercial nodes and needs. Vacant position of the HRA analyst left a gap in redevelopment and economic development work. The Opportunity Housing Ordinance involves multiple divisions, therefore it is not held in a primary division. Public assistance has been absorbed by the city and HRA and not passed through to the development community. There have been missed opportunities for development and there is a need to review general counsel services for the HRA. Next slide. However, I have mentioned the housing continuum and I wanna show you the whole housing continuum and what that means and how the HRA works along the housing continuum. So as you can see in the pictures here, we have homelessness, which is outside unsheltered, emergency shelter, transitional housing, and community housing. Above that bracket, you'll see a list of programs and policies that, although that list looks very simple, it is very vast and broad. Next, we have affordable rental. Underneath that bracket, you'll see our project-based vouchers, our housing choice vouchers, our assisted rental program, and development subsidy. Again, that sounds very small, but that takes a lot of work over a lot of time and a lot of interaction. Affordable home ownership is next, and you'll see our land trust program, blighted homes program, 
rental homes for future home buyers, our senior home program, and our nonprofit single family development. And that is encompassing other programs like MACV, Twin, uh, Habitat for Humanity, and other PPL, and other places that have developed affordable homeownership options in addition to the land trust program. Next, you have our market value rental. You'll see housing choice vouchers again. And that is because just because they have a housing choice voucher does not always mean they go into an affordable development. Sometimes they are in a market rate development and through that work of a staff in the HRA and the housing choice vouchers, they're able to do that. We also have our Fair Housing Implementation Council. And then last but surely not least, market value homes. And you'll see down payment assistance, our energy loans, our lead-based pain abatement, a brush with kindness, our biennial home fair, and our foreclosure prevention assistance. Again, the HRA works along the whole housing continuum, and that is fully represented here. Next slide. So the assessment recommendations is that the HRA would focus their mission towards the continuum of housing, that very vast continuum, and less on redevelopment of multifamily, whereas the HRA would focus more on housing projects with 20 or less units. This would encompass single family, townhomes, home ownership opportunities, and then move the majority of multifamily commercial redevelopment and business and or economic development into the Port Authority. And from here, I'll pass it to Shane Redlane. Thanks, Carla and Erica. Thanks, uh, Act Madam Acting Mayor and Council. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the Port Authority. So again, the assessment and the consultant took a look at the HRA, um, the Port Authority's powers, and the HRA powers, and came to the same conclusion that our legal staff had come to um, both internal and external counsel that there doesn't need to be an EDA as a separate entity for the city to do what it wants to do through commercial node redevelopment, business development, business outreach, outreach small business growth, etc. Um, the port um, was created in 1981. Um, the Port Authority has the same powers as the St. Paul Port Authority and a few extra ones as well. Um, when it carries out the essential functions of government, it ca carries out those um, essential functions in, of, as, as of the state, which is a really powerful um, <clears throat> uh, action. Next slide, please. And, um, you know, originally the Port Authority was created to develop marginal property. This is a little bit of an old definition, and the Port Council says the Port Authority statute could use a little bit of cleanup, but as we all know, and we'll get to a little bit later tonight, changing state statute is a little, a little tricky at times. Um, that said, the Port Authority has broad powers, those of an, e, um, an EDA, most of the powers of the HRA. The HRA does have, have a few specific things that the Port Authority doesn't have, but nothing in this assessment um, would say that we couldn't um, reach back um, with the HRA and use those um, very unique powers for certain housing functions in the future. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> So again, um, the assessment of, of staff for this, this work um, would include the port growing to include five FTEs, which it doesn't um, currently have, three of which would come from the HRA. Those are FTEs that would um, have uh, titles that are reworked based on, on the needs that we're talking about here tonight. Um, there would be two, we're proposing two new FTEs um, from where we are at today. Um, again, you know, the HRA and, and the port and the city have been doing commercial node redevelopment through the decades. Um, but I think it's this council and other boards' interest to do more commercial node redevelopment across the city. In order to do that, you need more people and more money. Um, at this point, we're asking for more people, and those people could help bring uh, more money through grants and other things. Um, one of the lo long-term vacant positions would be filled, um, continue the successes of the Opportunity Housing Ordinance. Um, the two new FTEs would work on business development, expansion, and retention activities, um, and how that business development center at uh, old F FS3, Fire Station 3, would be determined in 2023. Whether or not the economy slows down, some of that work may be able to be handled with the uh, five FTEs that we're talking about. If the economy keeps going and, and the council and HRA and Port Authority decide to continue on with um, heavy commercial node redevelopment, then um, it might be determined that we meet, need more people, but that's, that's a decision that the council and the boards can make in the future. And so to fund the work in the Port Authority, we'd decrease the HRA levy by an amount and then increase or turn on the Port Authority levy in that exact same amount. So the impact to taxpayers would be um, the same. So there would be no increase in taxes for this work 
increase the port levy, turn down the HRA levy in, in an exact same amount. Um, and then we would take um, citywide or creative place making citywide. So in a relatively modest amount, $200,000, we've heard the council and other community groups that um, creative place making should be citywide. Staff, I couldn't agree more. Um, we would dedicate 200,000 of those funds um, to, that, to that work. Next slide, please. And so just in, in simple terms, what the Port Authority does right now is focus on development in South Loop, um, where 65% of Bloomington's projected development exists. We do do commercial and multifamily redevelopment. Um, we do also business development. For large business, those are mostly real estate projects, um, like SICK and Mall of America, big hotel projects, and multifamily. Um, for small business, uh, um, you know, we've got the Open to Business program, which is... Um, I don't want to say a little bit surprising to me how successful that's been um, and the awareness in the business community based on the survey that we did um, during the pandemic. Um, we got into more small business loans and grants through CARES funding, which the city hadn't um, previously funded through um, levy or, or other funds. And so we kind of got you know our feet wet with those during, during the pandemic with CARES, which was helpful to a lot of small businesses and um, got us an exposure to that group that we didn't have before. Um, then we had some emerging and, and evolving items like the facade program, which is being talked about, um, doing more small business outreach. And then, of course, um, the business incubator um, in the prior, fire station three. And, of course, we do the creative place making in South Loop as well. Um, but what we're proposing here, the changes are in red. So the development would be, would be citywide. It would focus on commercial nodes. And it would really provide a one-stop shop for subsidized development. The standard non-subsidized development would continue to happen through the planning department um, just like it does today. Um, we do more business development, focus on, on BIPOC businesses, and on the emerging and evolving um, area of this slide, we would be implementing those programs and doing more small business outreach. And again, creative placemaking would be brought citywide. So that's really it in a nutshell um, for the Port Authority's piece of this on, on one slide. And with that, I'll turn it over to Glenn. All right. Uh, good evening, Acting Mayor Carter, Council Members. So I want to talk a little bit about how the assessment uh, recommendations relate specifically to the Opportunity Housing Ordinance. Uh, before you, you see a graph of housing production since 2011. And before the city adopted the Opportunity Housing Ordinance, uh, there were concerns that it may have a negative impact on housing production. Uh, as you can see uh, in this graph, uh, it did not. Um, the OHO was adopted in February of 2019, and um, you know those negative impacts did not materialize. In fact, housing production has gone way up uh, since it was adopted. Uh, that may be due to various factors. Um, certainly, the market was great uh, during that time frame, but uh, recently we've seen almost as much housing production in one year, in actually the three uh, most recent years that we've seen in decades uh, in the past. So next slide. Uh, specifically, if we look at 21 and 22, uh, Bloomington has had 17 multifamily projects completed, under construction, or approved. And those projects uh, total well over 2,600 units. Uh, I'd note that 11 of the projects include affordable units, and with those projects, uh, Bloomington is over 77% of the way to, to its 2030 uh, affordable housing goals, which are assigned by the Metropolitan Council. Now, looking at the various income bands, uh, the 60% uh, band, there were well over uh, the 2030 goal. And the 50% uh, band, we've made very good progress. And then the 30% band is where we have the most work to do. Um, and that is the most difficult uh, band to address. Next slide. So there are significant uh, staff uh, support that goes into the Opportunity Housing Ordinance. Duties range uh, from negotiation, to financial analysis, reporting, monitoring. And these duties cross many divisions, many departments. 
So the divisions here tonight, obviously, have planning, HRA, Port Authority, but also the legal department, the finance department uh, play a very big role in the Opportunity Housing Ordinance. Uh, next slide. And fortunately, we have an existing position in place uh, that would specifically work on this project that's currently uh, vacant. Um, but the assessment recommends filling the position and then allocating the position, uh, the time spent among various divisions. So that includes 50% of time uh, within the Port Authority, 30% in planning, and then 20% within the HRA. So this time, I'll turn it back to Ms. Henderson. Thank you. So again, next slide, please. We just want to recap what we are want to discuss this, after, this evening. Um, really want the bodies of the HRA and the Port Authority to do what they do best. Um, I know at our council retreat, you heard the story of um, the 92-year-old. We have a story of a 21-year-old. I mean, really wanting the HRA to focus on people and programs and not the bricks and mortar. It's clear the Port Authority um, definitely uh, has done an excellent job in South Loop and really wanting to supersize that by moving the majority of our multifamily and commercial redevelopment to the port. Uh, the OHO position that Glenn talked about is included in those five FTEs. Uh, like Shane mentioned, three of those are currently vacant that are sitting in the HRA. We have not filled those. So really, we're talking about two FTEs. Um, again, some of the numbers that we've started to look at uh, to put those five FTEs into uh, an import levy uh, fully funded in terms of IT and um, benefits, it's about $600,000. Adding another $200,000 for creative placemaking um, comes to $800,000. Right now, the HRA Development Fund levy is about one, it's over $1.6 million that's allocated annually. So we have this very complicated spreadsheet uh, working with Lori economy Scholler and her team and our accountant, Mary Lee, um, where we said, okay, if we took, let's say, $1.4 million next year, that would pay for the five FTEs, the $200,000, giving some leeway also for facade improvement or, you know, displacement uh, funds. Um, that would leave $200,000 in the HRA development fund, but they have a healthy fund balance. So uh, it will be, a, the fund will be able to sustain all the payments that they need to make their obligations, future obligations for quite some time. Um, so those are kind of some of the numbers that we're looking at. Uh, and I think the next slide talks about what we're looking to do. We have not taken this to the HRA board or the Port Authority board um, wanting to take it to this honor body first um, based on some past practices um, that our city manager can speak to better than I can about service assessments. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you to each of you. Uh, Mr. City Manager, did you have a comment that you wanted to make? Uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. There we go again. Acting mayor and uh, council members, man, exercise that new muscle. Um, uh, as uh, our community development director uh, suggested, this is, first of all, this is a, a, a continuation of a long-running practice that we have over the past uh, five, six years now of doing service assessments. Uh, and I'm glad that Erica mentioned how long the HRA has been in existence here, 51 years, with um, not much, um, not much uh, effort or uh, time spent uh, considering uh, either impact or uh, how we approach the work to make sure that it continues to be relevant today in the same way that it was 51 years ago. Uh, that's the same approach that we've used for 
all the other service assessments that we've done over the last five or six years is making sure that we are going back and looking at the programs and services that we deliver uh, and continue to ask that question of is this doing the right what and making sure that it is still meeting the objectives that the council has as a policy body that staff has as a service provider. And so uh, the HRA assessment is in keeping with the practice that we have uh, done over those last few years. Um, this is a, a project that's owned by the city council because ultimately you're deciding on the allocation of resources. Um, the council has a service agreement with both the Port Authority and the HRA to provide uh, staff resources uh, to make sure that those missions are carried out. Our feeling was it was appropriate to bring it here first. Um, and I understand that that uh, um, has been um, not not necessarily universally agreed upon by some of the other stakeholders in the conversation. And I certainly respect their opinion on that. Don't argue their perspective at all. Just following on what we've done before. So, having said all that, I really want to thank the staff. Um, they've done a superb job working with our consultant to do this evaluation. Uh, this is really complicated and complex material when you're talking about the millions of dollars at stake and even more than that uh, talking about the impact that the operations in the HRA and the Port Authority and the Planning Division have on this community both in the uh, in the current uh, day and in decades in the future um, this is this is a really important conversation so I want to acknowledge their work too thank you thank you mr. Rebergi. Uh, so I guess I will just um, make a quick comment, and I have several questions, but I'll only ask one because uh, I know that there are probably many uh, questions written down up here uh, waiting to be asked. And so I guess um, first, just yes, I really appreciate in general that this assessment was done. I think there's been uh, frustration for many years that we don't have the same level of economic development across the city that we have in South Loop and I serve on the Port Authority I am very excited and proud of the work that's happening in South Loop it's exciting it's needed and um, really really excited by the opportunity to really uh, put, get some momentum behind the neighborhood redevelopment that we know people in Bloomington really want to see uh, so one quick question that I have um, it was mentioned that uh, you know the Port Authority has, uh, in in many ways, greater power than the HRA does, but that the HRA does have some unique powers. And so I guess I'm just curious: Are there, with this new approach, if we take this approach, are there any risks or or any potential losses that we should be considering before we kind of really move forward with approving this decision? Thank you, Acting Mayor, Council Members. <clears throat> so, um, you know, the devil's in the details a little bit. Um, as far as powers go, like the one unique power that the HRA has that the port doesn't have is that they can be a member of an LLC for a particular housing project, right? But again, you know, this is the first time that the bodies are, are seeing this, and I imagine we'll take the comments that we get from y'all tonight comments we get from the Port Authority and comments we get from the HRA and in the end perhaps you know that we, we even had the conversation today you know do the HRA and Port Authority meet quarterly in a joint session we don't typically do that um, certainly we wouldn't want to throw away that power that the HRA has there may be a use for it and I don't think what we're saying tonight is that you know the HRA wouldn't be involved and use that tool it's just that for the majority of the business stuff and the larger multifamily mixed-use developments the Port Authority would be doing that, the board's experienced um, in that. And um, so yeah, so that, that's, I, I don't think there are any risks because I don't think we're really giving up anything, certainly not statutorily, we're just shifting around which functions and what departments are gonna do that work, which boards are gonna see most of those developments come through. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, I would just add to that, Acting Mayor, that um, what we're proposing here is actually just working better together. Mm -hmm. And so, no, um, there's not at this moment foreseen risk because we're proposing working better together and pulling on our strengths and being more collaborative. Whereas we are separate entities, we are one Bloomington. And so we want to work like that. Thank you. Questions? Council Member Martin and then Coulter. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor. I've got a, a few of them here. I'll, I'll just start with uh, one or two uh, and then send it to the, one of my colleagues. 
I, I know in the HRA assessment, there was a lot of recurring themes uh, in the staff feedback, uh, kind of about the state of affairs generally, saying there was some confusion about um, kind of their, their input or broader strategic direction, uh, mentioned how they were stretched thin. And, and I love uh, a lot of this kind of speaks directly to that. Um, but with regard to the structure of this discussion itself, uh, I'm wondering, so if we if we say let's let's move forward with these recommendations and then it is presented to both the port and the HRA, well, at that point, we've already pulled the trigger on saying let's move forward. So that ship has kind of sailed uh, a little bit. So then are, is staff uh, and the HRA board's feedback, what does that look like when it comes back to us? Because there's, there's, some of them are saying we're not being heard, and I just want to make sure they're being heard. Absolutely. Thank you, Acting Mayor, Council Members. Um, thank you for the question. So staff was actually presented this information prior to. Um, staff will have continued conversations. Um, but I do want to add that, again, the HRA is 51 years old, and I have great staff that have been here with institutional knowledge for 20 years, longer than 20 years. The HRA is on paper. The city has moved forward and done things and um, updated technology, but the HRA has not. And so one of the conversations and discussions and action steps that is happening with staff is how can we look at the work that staff is doing primarily in rehab and Section 8? That is where staff's focus is primarily situated. Um, how can we look at that work and look where we can, again, work better together? Accounting, legal, there's different things that we are doing um, that is duplicative in the HRA, which is causing a strain on staff, but also as we are growing with the new units that Mr. Markergaard showed you, uh, there's been an increase in the work of housing assistance and really um, working with people. And my, I would have to just say that my staff truly have a heart for people and really spend a lot of time, not just work, but there's an emotional pull that happens with my staff when they are working with people to meet their needs and maintain their housing here in Bloomington, as well as those that are moving to Bloomington. So it's a both and. While we are going through this process and we are learning and engaging, staff is um, being asked and included. But I do want to highlight that at the point of the assessment and the interviews, we were returning from a pandemic where when we did go to being uh, remote, um, prior to me starting, HRA did not even have laptops. They were 100% on desktops. So it's a lot. And so I just want to highlight that, highlight just the, the evolution and that um, we are in it together. And I'll continue to work with staff, listen to staff, and respond to staff because there's a difference between being heard and being listened to. And um, if I could, um, Acting Mayor, Council members, Council Member Martin, I think it's important that um, some of the things that Erica has done that happened were in place or going on uh, while the assessment was going on. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about the building and inspection permit um, because right now the rehab loans happen. We send an employee out, they do the scope, the contractor goes out, goes, comes to us, pulls a permit, um, does the job, and then we send a building inspector out, and then the HRA staff member was going out. And so we started to see some duplicate efforts. And I know some change is hard, but it just doesn't make sense to send two vehicles to the same address to check on the same work when the building inspector actually has to physically close out that permit. And so we implemented um, with our building inspection staff what we call an HRA permit. So I know it may, on the surface, for somebody who's been doing that work for 25 years, say, wow, you know, I don't want to give up that drive going to see, you know, that new siding put on that house. Um, but again, we want to be efficient and um, with the resources that we have. So I don't know if you want to add anything, Erica. Yes. Um, thank you, Carla. There have been changes made during that. Um, so one of the things while this assessment was actually beginning, the rehab program had just come back online. Um, inspections were taken from six staff, all doing inspections, also trying to figure out paperwork to two dedicated staff and depending on our building and inspections division. So there were things that could be made, uh, changes that could be made for improvement 
while I came in listening to staff where they did say, we're stretched thin. And I'm like, what's going on? Tell me what your work is. What can I take off your plate? How can I figure this out? Again, I've talked with staff, and one of the things is, well, we didn't see the whole picture. So that was me coming back and saying, oh, I can improve my communication style. Better yet, say, here's the high-level vision, but I want you to help me get there. And so those are the things that have happened while this was going on. Thank you. That's, I appreciate the clarification. I'll leave it at that, ma'am. Okay, and I do just want to uh, clarify before we move on, I think, to Council Member Coulter. So the motion in front of us is to support and continue to explore the recommendations above and present these recommendations to the HRA and Port Authority. So can you just talk more about, like, what that really means? Like, are we approving, officially approving anything, or are we just saying, hey, like, in general, we are very supportive, continue the conversations, but but then we know there are going to be other decision points ahead of us. Can you just talk about that? Sure, um, Acting Mayor, Council Members, um, Ac Madam Acting Mayor Carter. Uh, so yes, what we're looking for tonight is basically, we like the idea, we want you to go to the other stakeholders that are would be affected by this, have the conversation. Um, we have baked in enough time that we could put this, if, if the green light goes as part of our budget process, and so... Um, that that would be when we would be bringing it back before this honorable body, correct, city manager? Okay. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. And um, it's a mouthful. I haven't even said it out loud yet, and I'm kind of afraid to. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, Council Member Coulter. Thank you. Um, just. Um, so I, I have a number of questions here, and I have some comments that I think I will save until later. But um, that that last clarification, by the way, that was that was really really helpful for me. Um, just just sort of be sort of clear about this, and I, I it's maybe just be maybe just because the language isn't in here. <clears throat> excuse me. Just to be clear, I do not have COVID. I just have young kids who are sick all the time because young kids are sick all the time. Um, I, I, but just to be clear, staff, you, you do support these recommendations. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes. Okay. That I, 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 <laughs> because typically we would not bring anything before you that we did not. A recommended motion or something like that. So I just wanted to, to make sure that um, I was understanding that correctly. So, um, and maybe this is a question for Erica specifically, but... The, this concept of the HRA focusing on people versus structures, basically, is what I heard. Could you expand on that um, a little bit? I'd, I'd just like to know a little bit more about what that means and specifically what, uh, how that affects work that uh, will be done by HRA staff as well as the HRA board. Absolutely. Thank you, Acting Mayor and Council Member Coulter and Council Members. So one, I want to say that the current structure of the HRA involves six program specialists, one program manager, one HRA administrator, one office support specialist, and one office assistant, and one HRA analyst. Out of all of those positions, three of them are vacant. One of them is working on development, the HRA administrator. The six program specialists are working on rental assistance, rehab programs, home buyer programs, inspections, and so the propose here is that we would not actually impact the direct work of the program specialists that are working on development because they're not working on development. However, the program specialists um, we do have are working on blighted homes and single family homes. That's where they help out and where they uh, really prioritize that. So when we say that we are focused on focusing more on people rather than brick and mortar, 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 excuse me. It takes a lot to get a multifamily development going, especially affordable multifamily that requires development. Um, nothing against that. It just, if it was market rate, they can come up with no problem. When it is on the administrator and or one other position in the HRA, we have leaned to um, consultants. Uh, prior to... Um, Previously, we had the economic development analyst um, part-time with the HRA, which was a major help.
because of the ability to do financial analysis. And when we switched from that because of the growth and the work in multifamily development in the South Loop in particular, we had to lean more on consultants to really do that work. And so the way that this is designed would be that we would look at more of the program specialists doing what they do best, working with the community, working with people. They're already out there doing that. They're not really working with developers. However, we would look at how we could streamline that work and increase their ability to do more of our um, service, direct services. For instance, we have the Rental Homes for Future Home Buyers program. Staff actually does the property management and oversees the property maintenance. By simply being able to outsource that and look at something different, they can work better with the tenants and or the renters that are in those units for a higher success rate of home ownership. So when I say focus more on the people, please do not get me wrong. Constructing multifamily affordable housing is focusing on the people, but it's a long-term approach. When people need housing now, when they need resources now, when they are calling now, those are the strengths of my staff, and that's the strength that I want to play up in the HRA. Thank you. That's a, that's a really helpful explanation. Um, if I could, just a, a few more quick questions here. Um, so the, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the proposals that the HRA would focus on housing projects with 20 or fewer units, where did that 20 number come from? Absolutely. Thank you for the question. So I pulled on my background. <laughs> um, side note, when I was in the city of Minneapolis, I literally had to do this exact thing. And we had to look at what the priorities were and what was that missing middle housing. Missing middle housing is usually 20 units or less, sometimes 40 units or less. And so that number 20, please do not get caught on it. It might need to be tweaked, but it's more of a focus on single family or um, single family detached, single family attached, as well as townhomes. Where is that sweet spot for looking at rental, affordable rental, and affordable home ownership in Bloomington? And so that's where that number came from. Thank you. That's um, that that's helpful to know because I my part of my concern was how that jives with. Mm -hmm. The, the concept of this continuum of housing. So it's it's good to know that it, it's it's not so much the exact figure as it is the types of housing. Mm -hmm. So thank you. That's that's really, really helpful. Um, and then um, you sort of just spoke to this now, but um, I'd be curious to know how, excuse me, how this proposal compares to other, the way other local HRAs operate within, at least within the state of Minnesota. Um, is this, I mean, is this kind of, for lack of a better phrase, getting us closer to best practice, or is this sort of charting a different territory or somewhere in between? What, is, what does that look like? Thank you. So we are in a unique position, being that we are Bloomington, and I'm going to tell you my elevator speech that I gave the city manager and a few hundred, a hundred of my colleagues earlier this last week. Um, we are the fourth largest city in the state. We are the third largest city in the Twin Cities Metro. We are the second largest city in Hennepin County, the largest county in the state, and we are the largest suburb. There are no other HRAs that compare to us. The other HRAs do not have the level of um, vouchers that we have that would be comparable. The next size HRA to us would either be Plymouth, which is small, St. Louis Park in Plymouth, or Met Council. And so we are in a very unique position because that we do offer the assistance, we do offer our rehab loans that we do not outsource, and we do offer other opportunities for homeownership and blighted um, homes redevelopment. So to say all that, to say that if we were to compare to another public housing authority, it would be Minneapolis, and they don't do what we do. And so this is us setting the tone, and this is us being the leader as the largest suburb in the state for all the other HRAs like Plymouth and St. Louis Park that are looking to us. Thank you. And then uh, just one last question, I promise. Well, probably not my last question. Let's be honest with ourselves here. Um, I've, oh, I always say that, and it never ends up being the case, so I should just be honest with myself. Um, 
I, I, one of the concerns I have about um, shifting more economic development uh, to the Port Authority uh, is, I mean, partly, frankly, from the statutory language around HRAs. And I, I, if you could just speak to, I mean, it, it specifically calls out the, that the per, one of the purposes of HRAs, you mentioned, is to clear and redevelop blighted areas. And then there's another piece, redevelop blighted areas in situations in, with, in which private enterprise would not act without government participation. So um, I, I guess um, if you could speak to sort of how the HRA intends to ensure that it's fulfilling the statutory requirement related to that redevelopment piece um, while also sort of shifting much of that discussion to the Port Authority, I think that'd be helpful. Absolutely. Thank you. So I'll start and then I'll send it to Shane. Um, so when I when I read this to redevelop blighted areas, um, it's dilapidated. You, you know the definition of, of blight. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be economic. It doesn't have to be a commercial property. A blighted area can be a residential property. So I don't actually read this and, and think that we're only allowed to do economic development or housing. I read this as we can still do housing in blighted areas and we would not change like our blighted homes program where the HRA um, is able to purchase property that is privately owned and it's usually residential. We remove the blight, therefore we are raising and removing or allowing for the home to be rehabilitated and then creating opportunities for home ownership. That function does not go away. But the port has superpowers. And so, Shane, would you like to speak to your superpowers? <laughs> Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Acting Mayor, Council Members, and Council Member Coulter. Um, so, again, the, the port and HRA have really o a lot of overlapping powers. And so the mission of the Port Authority is stated a little bit differently in the statute um, than the HRA. But their power overlap is there's, there's a lot of overlapping. There's a few powers, again, that the port has that the HRA doesn't, and this one that I could find that the HRA has that the port doesn't. That doesn't mean that we couldn't use it. So I, I see you know, the HRA fulfilling its um, statutory powers with all of the things that they're doing on the continuum of housing, um, but certainly they don't need to do the blight removal if another agency in the city is doing it. So to me... Um, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. The port is going to be doing what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, again, this is a Venn diagram. We talked about actually creating a Venn diagram slide. Now, now makes me wish that we would have done that, <laughs> but we didn't. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I think that's the answer. Again, the Port Authority statute is a bit messy. Ideally, that gets cleaned up at some point. But yeah. thank you. Um, I will say that I was talking to Jamie earlier, and I mentioned it would be helpful to have a Venn diagram. <laughs> um, Councilmember D'Alessandro. Plus one for Venn diagrams. <laughs> uh, thank you all for your time tonight. Really appreciate this. I can tell you a lot of work has gone into this, and um, uh, I appreciate the diligence and the focus that you have on our residents, so thank you. Um, a question uh, for you um, about the continuum that you have in your slides, um, what of those programs needs to be um, either eliminated or uh, moved or adjusted dramatically or anything as a result of the recommendations that you have? Thank you. Um, it would potentially be development subsidy because development subsidy en encompasses so much that's not just single family homes, that is also um, multifamily. But again, that is a decision for the city to make because the tax increment financing that the HRA actually does is allocated to the city and 5% is split to the HRA, 5% to the port, 5% to the city. So it, out of everything, development subsidy possibly, but I think we would still have a role to play in that. Okay, so there's no expectation that any of these uh, programs would need to stop as a result of the change in resources or anything like that? Not at all. Okay. And the funding associated with them? The funding with them is not, excuse me, 
Homelessness Response and Prevention Services is American Rescue Plan Act dollars currently, and Down Payment Assistance is American Rescue Plan Act dollars currently. So let me call that out. Um, everything else, there is not um, a proposal to change the funding, and the funding is um, sufficient outside of the development fund of the HRA. Okay. Um, and I don't know if this is maybe a better question for the city manager as opposed to you folks, um, but um, it, there's an implication in the deck here that the Opportunity Housing Ordinance um, was passed by us but not resourced by us uh, as it is now looking for a home. Is that, my, is that a correct assessment of what happened? And if so... Um, is the is the recommendation here that to give it a home and that home should be the port authority if I'm understanding this correctly? Uh, Acting Mayor Carter and Councilmember D'Alessandro, I, I think that's a pretty accurate understanding. So uh, we we relied on the, uh, the TIF authority of the HRA uh, to. Um, be the leverage for the other dollars that came in for OHO, and uh, you know the. <clears throat> The where the resources come from are getting a little bit more clear as we go. Um, this will provide more clarity to it. I don't look at that as a deficiency in terms of how the opportunity housing ordinance was set up, um, but it is it is a factor here. Yeah. Okay, um, that's helpful. And um, is the function of that 50, 30, 20 split across the, I think the port, the planning department and the HRA, was that a, is that a function of um, the fact that we did most of the development in the South Loop? Like, is it, I don't want to use that, st that, that number as a, as a, oh, that's how it should be split because that's how it happened over the last couple of years when, of course it did because it was South Loop and that's where the port works. So how do we leverage that information against like what would have happened if we'd been doing this citywide from the beginning? Um, of course. City man, uh, Assistant City Manager Sable, can you go to the slide that had the OHO co coordination duties? It's towards the end. Going the wrong way. This is how that was um, brought forward. Um, so, one fifty percent is looking at where would that need to be the face. Where would that need to talk to developers and bring them in? Um, the previous position that was filled as the HRA analyst, that was the face mm -hmm. of the opportunity housing ordinance. Um, and so one of the things is if we are moving forward and have support to continue exploring uh, the Port Authority primarily taking on the multifamily, the lead of multifamily development, then the OHO face, that position, would need to spend more time there. The 30% for the planning division was due to um, the entitlements and the work that comes with the ordinance, because it's an ordinance that is a code. And then the 20% with the HRA comes through on the affordable units and the coordination with the program specialists that are doing Section 8. Because when the Opportunity Housing Ordinance was passed, um, at that point, there was not much conversation with the Section 8 staff about how their work could potentially increase. And what we have seen, looking back, is it has um, skyrocketed because when people port in, so when they have a voucher from another community, we aren't turning them away. So the staff still has that work to do on top of the people that are already here and that are receiving our vouchers. And so that's where the 20% is in that coordination, having those meetings with the management staff, different coordination of pieces like that in that end result of still achieving the affordable housing units in Bloomington. That is where the proposal of this breakdown of time allocation came from. Great. Thank you. One quick final question. Is there a corresponding service assessment being done on the Port Authority right now? Uh, Acting Mayor, Councilmember D'Alessandro, there is not. Should we, there? We, had, uh, we didn't necessarily say that the Port Authority was part of the assessment here. Um, we were wrapping 
the the role that the Port Authority and planning plays in the work that the HRA does as part of the assessment, but we did not say we're specifically doing an assessment of the port. Okay, thank you. Council Member Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I got a couple questions. Could you clarify, there was a statement that um, this wouldn't increase the levy, but it would just shift it from HRA to the port, but can you explain to me how we can add two FTEs and $200,000 and not increase the levy? Oh, your budget. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Acting Mayor and Council Member Nelson, Council Members. So um, by taking the three vacant positions in the HRA and moving those three vacant positions to the Port Authority to assign that work, one, that's moving that funding that would have been paid out of the um, – adjusted for within the HRA levy. It's lowering that amount to move with those positions. Then the two additional positions, it's looking at that levy again with the HRA and saying, oh, the two additional positions, what's salary and benefits, what's the needs, moving that amount. And then the $200,000 on top of that. So it is lowering the HRA levy by an amount and turning the port authority levy on commensurate to that amount. That is a net zero change at this time to taxpayers because the HRA levy is at the max. If I could, Acting Mayor Carter, um, Council Member, Council Member Nelson, um, Erica hinted at this about the consultants. So right now, professional services and consultants for the development fund, what's budgeted for this year is seven hundred and fifty thousand yeah. um, dollars. We have relied very heavily on outside counsel. Um, you know, the, lots of duplicate services that are being provided. So we believe that that's where we will get additional resources to bring on permanent staff that can do the work that are here every day with us. So I wanted to add yes. that. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That makes sense. Um, the 20 unit threshold, um, do we have any idea how many projects would have been under that 20 units? I mean, I could think of one. That I shouldn't mention. Sure. <laughs> Acting Member Carter, <laughs> Council Member Nelson. Yes, there was uh, definitely one. Uh, pen. <laughs> Pen and 86 is an example. Question is, how far do you go? We have a lot of, say, two-family homes, individual two-family homes. Um, so those numbers kind of add up. Uh, one case where we had three units in a subdivision recently. Um, so quite a bit of that, uh, but we've just had the one townhome project recently. Okay. Um, next question. You did a great job of talking about how this would work for the staff. Uh, what about our boards? Um, you know, what would the role of the HRA board be now? What would the role of the port board be? Um, how would that be impacted by this? I can, I can answer that. Um, Acting Mayor, uh, Council Members, Council Member Nelson. So for the Port Authority, I don't think it changes much. They just see more, more projects, right? Um, they're, you know, a large part of what the Port Authority already does is deal with development projects and that just gets, you know, more, right? Um, maybe I'll let Erica talk about the, the HRA board. Thank you. So I would um, look at as of right now, the role of the HRA board would be to um, weigh in and provide input in line with the mission. And the mission is still to um, help create those units for low and moderate income. They would still have a role to play in advising around housing and the creation of housing in the city of Bloomington as the housing redevelopment authority in and for the city of Bloomington. Um, it would not be um, something that is surpassed. The board would not be surpassed. Their input is still very valuable and that is the uh, expertise that they have to provide that information. For clarification from me, what is their role currently in reviewing development applications? 
Thank you. Currently, they do not review development applications. That is at the staff level in reviewing um, development proposals that start with planning and then come to the HRA if there is an ask for subsidy. And so at this point, unless it is land that the HRA owns, the HRA board is approving the use of subsidy. Okay. And then um, what is the, the port weighs in on more development projects from my experience, is that accurate? So that is something they're used to doing the, the bo at the board level, not just the staff level. Certainly, acting mayor, council members, council member Nelson. Yeah, so the, you know, all of the port, what we do now slide, and then what we would do more in the future, um, they would just have um, more action to take on all those things. Again, they of course act on development projects. Um, they have involvement with uh, open to business program. Um, they were involved along with the city council and the CARES funding and, and that, um, but there are a number of new programs that the port would start to become more involved in. Again, the facade program, more small, small business outreach. And then there's the fire station three project, the, the business incubator, how that, um, would be staffed and, and managed and funded is still TBD at this point. It's still a project that's being developed. But so yeah, so the, the port just has, it's not exactly what they're doing today, but it's a lot of the same and similar things that, that they have been doing. And so they just have more agenda items. Okay. Um, my last question um, just regards, and I think you touched on a little bit here, Shane, is the business development, because that was originally my interest um, heavily in this, is what can we do more to, to help people start a business, grow their business here, uh, and so I know that we're doing those things. Can you talk to me a little bit about, uh, you know, is that all kind of future de decisions about staffing, or how is that playing out in this proposal? How will we make sure we can accomplish those goals? Thank you, Acting Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Nelson. So, um, you know, we played around with the org charts a bit, um, but again, we wanted to uh, see what the council thought about the idea first. But, um, you know, if if this all plays out how we've been talking about it, there would certainly be a, you know, a number of staff at the Port Authority that would be real estate focused and kind of big business, kind of the existing functions that the Port Authority is already doing um, or doing the most of. And then there would be another another wing that would work on the business development items, all the kind of other things that um, are small business related. Um, again, the facade, um, business resource center, small business outreach, that type of thing. So, directly to your point, there would be a group of people focusing more on that. Of course, with the economy and different initiatives coming through, they would flex back and forth as um, you know the need arises. Um, but that's there would be staff initially certainly dedicated directly to that. Thank you. Council Member Lemon. Well, certainly I have some questions, but Mayor, I'm sure I said you said you had a couple of questions. You okay? All right, want to just give you a chance to get in there if you want to. <laughs> so just a comment, and then I've got you know like 20 other questions. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, no, I only got three and a half questions. Uh, uh, so uh, <laughs> so certainly uh, when we look at this, I'm, I get very excited. Uh, you know, eight years ago or so ago, uh, a number of us uh, uh, new council members wanted to see something done around business nodes and redevelopment. And so when I saw that, I got really excited when I saw that. And it's just proof that it shows you got to stay around a long time sometimes to get things changed. <laughs> Um, and so I guess uh, I make that statement in, in that I, I'm less now concerned uh, in terms of structure, but much more interested uh, in results. I, I just trust that staff can, 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 can put together the type of structure that's necessary to try to achieve the goals that the, uh, the council has put forward. And so that's sort of the, the um, you know, what, what I would say. And so my question would be, do you believe this would get you the best results uh, from that? But that's more of a comment than I have anything else. Um, Next on my list, um, I too share what Council Member Nelson, uh, when I heard uh, $200,000 for creative make, clay place making another goal eight years ago that we wanted to see happen, uh, that I saw on this, I got excited about it, but then I also said to myself, well, how do you come up with $200,000? Um, and I guess my question is more so from a long-term perspective. I know that there are dollars that are within HRA that are revolving, and there's, in a, in a sense, a nest egg there based on uh, loans that we have out there. But when we look 
when we go out past that that nest egg, if we burn that up, um, I, I just um, I, I just I don't know if I believe, <laughs> and maybe I just need to be shown this, but I know I heard you know seven fifty thousand um, uh, um, uh, dollars, seven hundred and fifty thousand uh, uh, dollars of of contract work and duplicative work out there. Um, I mean, I just, I, I find that concerning that we had that much just kind of slushing around out, out there. And maybe that's, maybe that's the wrong way to, way to look at it. But uh, if we're spending that amount of money on external, I've got some other questions in terms of, of when we talk about the levy and that kind of thing. So, um, uh, so I, I just think there needs to be more of a conversation um, uh, around that and, and how long term uh, are those dollars that we're securing. I know some cities... Um, uh, put that into their, you know, when you make your, your development agreements uh, or uh, your park uh, 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 dedications, you, you have that for your creative placemaking. And so I just, you know, if, if we're doing this $200,000 for creative placemaking, is it a, uh, you know, a few years that we're looking to try to do this? Or is this really a long-term uh, strategy that we're looking at? So I guess I'll, I'll leave it there as, as my question. Acting Mayor Carter, Council Members, Council Member Lohman, it is a long-term strategy. Um, right now, we are levying a levy. The levy that goes into the development fund for the HRA is over one point six million dollars, um, and we haven't been producing much development with that fund. Um, so, when you say that as a taxpayer, when, I, when I'm hearing that, we have money just sitting around that just. No, help me, I mean, help me understand that because I mean I know what you're saying. Well, but I'm just I'm hearing well, my we, resident we, right now saying we get we get proposals, we get developments. We don't have internal staff to vet should this development go forward uh, for a TIF district. So mm -hmm. we defer to outside consultants um, to do a lot of that work. Um, the most recent one was was 8200 Humboldt. Yes, was that the most recent yes. one that we got, mm -hmm. and we needed an outside agency to help us vet that. We couldn't use the port staff because they are they can't do work outside of South Loop. So it really ties our hands sometimes to get that project before you over the finish line. Now that blighted building's coming down and now we're gonna have you know a nice building there. Yes. Erica, do you wanna add anything else about? No, that covered it. Okay. <laughs> so in other words, what I'm hearing you say, if we uh, expand the charter of the of the port who already has that staff there that are not working on these items right now this work now can be handled in-house saving that two hundred thousand dollars but now i'm hearing another five hundred thousand dollars out of money that <laughs> we could save taxpayers money too so i'm just i'm a little bit confused when i hear that okay. i mean that, um, it totally makes sense to me but sort of not i i understand yeah. um one of the things I will say is um, when we started talking about what this would mean. So Port Authority has staff right now that are dedicated to the South Loop. And Shane used the example of when he was in engineering, that when he worked on projects, he would charge his time to certain. So this pot of money that um, would be coming from basically the HR, where we would be turning down the HR levy and turning on a port levy, Staff then could, if they were working on developments or projects outside of South Loop, charge their time to that kind of like pot of money, that, that resource, so that they're not in violation of any of the funding that the South Loop um, currently gets. And I don't know if you want to add anything else, but that's, that's basically what that allows us to do. No, I think, I, I think that a, a, a resident would hear that and and would understand that. I, I, I understand it. I mean, I get it. I'm just playing dumb now. <laughs> but but, I, but I, I do think that if you're not used to handling these things on an ongoing basis, uh, there is a confusion when you hear that. Oh, all of a sudden, now there's magically $200,000. What? <laughs> you know? um, so I do appreciate you spending more time. Um, and I think we're going to need to continue uh, to have that conversation about that so that folks are clear um, as they hear that. Moving on. Um, so I, I like that continuum of, of service uh, piece that's up there. I think that's probably one of the clearest things I've ever seen since I've been on council. I really do like that. Um, uh, maybe a Venn diagram would be even better, <laughs> but I'll wait till I uh, <laughs> I'll wait till I see that. <laughs> when we look at those uh, continuums of service, 
right now, how much uh, money uh, as a percentage is being spent, you know, right now? I don't need precision, but, you know, if we look at each one of those uh, uh, areas, how much were we spending on that? And then kind of my follow-up question, my point five question is, what is the goal or the recommendation from staff uh, going forward in each one of those areas with this new uh, uh, proposal? Thank you, Acting Mayor Carter, Councilmember Lohman, Council Members. Um, so one, what's not highlighted on the continuum is that the funding is Section 8. CDBG as a mutual services agreement through with the HRA in the city, as well as um, rehab loans. So I want to highlight that because the Section 8 program in particular has funding from HUD for vouchers and admin. So that is a program that has predominantly been self-sustaining. There is maybe $100,000 of the levy every year that goes in to help the admin of that program. CDBG, that is the CDBG Rehab Loan, the Fair Housing Implementation Council, West Hennepin Affordable Housing Land Trust, um, as well as admin. So there's admin from the CDBG that is also paying for staff salaries and benefits to do that work. And then there is the loan, rehab loan fund. And the reason I call that out is because it's known as the neighborhood loan fund, where um, in years prior, strategic priorities funding has gone into that from the city council to allow for better opportunities to serve homeowners with a repayable loan. Mm -hmm. So what's also in that account is the interest and the repayments that are coming in from years of doing those loans. I, I appreciate of, I appreciate the you know the going through each one of the the dollar amounts of the piece. So let me let me ask it this way to make okay. it a little more clear. And I know we're we're, we're moving on time here, so I'll, I'll I'll wrap this up. I just have one other question after this uh, to maybe be a little more illustrative. Uh, so for example, um, I see home ownership in that middle of that uh, continuum, mm -hmm. and then we've got you know, rental mm -hmm. uh, uh, pieces there. So if we had 100%, you know, across that continuum, which I know there's there are items that are outside of that, mm -hmm. that, that, that continuum that are there, so it wouldn't equal 100%. We'd, let's just take home ownership. So right now today, um, how much money would you say as a percentage of the dollars that are spent in this continuum are spent on home ownership? And so if it's, let's say it's 1% today, and let's say five years from now, when we kind of move to this joint port HRA thing, goal as uh, staff comes up with a recommendation of maybe we're going to move to 5%. Uh, that, that's sort of the question I'm, I'm kind of asking. Okay. So really what the, the heart of my question is, from a process standpoint, is uh, what we have right now, are we planning on, you know, changing these percentages to, to try to achieve a, a different uh, policy goal, and that's part of the rationale of making this reorganization. Or no, we plan on spending the exact same amount of money, but uh, you know, getting more uh, benefit from that from that expenditure. Thank you uh, for clarifying that. It is the latter. We are not looking at changing these amounts. Um, I do want to add that home ownership, just because I'm in housing, I'm probably a housing nerd. This continuum includes the creation and the preservation of home ownership. And so when you say home ownership, I'm thinking, oh yeah, we're creating new homes, rental homes for future home buyers, land trusts, but foreclosure prevention assistance. So when we say home ownership, I'm looking at the whole thing. And so to answer your question, yeah, no, I'm not I, proposing changing the amounts for these dedicated activities. And I appreciate that. And I think that helps me to understand it. And I think that what I would, my comment back then to staff would be, uh, that I'd like to see some changes, you know, in terms of that, um, you know, the percentages I think that we have as, as for, from a taxpayer standpoint, we invest a lot of money in temporary uh, housing um, uh, over time because those, the, when we do affordable uh, housing in a rental type uh, situation, those dollars are, are not uh, permanent in a sense. They, they kind of go away. And so I just would hope that we would, would, would look to try to shift that balance uh, from that of the dollars in, in which that we spent on, a, on rental properties uh, and try to move that towards the ownership uh, piece of the pie. So, so now that I understand that that's what the plan is, I want to let you know this council member would like to see more dollars uh, of, as a percentage of this continuum uh, spent on uh, 
you know, on, on, on home ownership. And, and then finally, and I, I'll make this more as, as a comment so we can, we can move forward. Um, and I, I trust that this has happened, but, um, you know, we talked about the two demographics that are growing most, um, BIPOCs and seniors. And when we look at the uh, composition of those folks uh, who were consulted uh, through this policy uh, procedure, I'm not sure that I, I saw that makeup. Um, and, and maybe I just missed that, um, and we could talk about that offline. But I just want to make sure as we move forward with this, this proposal that we are continuing to make sure uh, that both the BIPOC and the seniors, uh, as you've identified as being the, uh, the two largest segments in the population, are, are being considered as we, as we look to, to both support this moving forward um, uh, both those uh, those groups or by, by getting uh, assistance from other, other groups uh, that are there that can help with that. Thank you. Okay, so I do want to try to move us along. Uh, if there are any last burning questions. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, it's not really a question, it's more of a comment. Um, I'm going to be honest, I'm a little unsettled on this uh, proposal. I appreciate the work and diligence that's gone into it. One of my concerns, and this is maybe more for the city manager, is along the lines of um, how the individuals on these boards uh, are selected. Um, the HRA is selected by us as the entire council in a very public process, um, and the port is selected by appointment by the mayor. Um, and so this gives significant change of power um, in my mind uh, to to the mayor uh, is my understanding. Um, I think a clarifying point is the HRA also by appointment? Yes. I oh. thought it was. Yeah. Oh, so I'm wrong. Yeah. Then I'm not concerned anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. There's yeah. a lot to keep track of. Yeah. And all of, yeah. Everything. All right. uh, all right. May I ask a clarifying question? Um, are we, excuse me, uh, Acting Mayor. Um, I just want to make sure, are, what is the next step here? Are we all going to just make our final comments and move on? Because I have comments, well, I think, but I, I held those back. So we can have comments. I also want to um, just remind everybody that this is not the last time we're going to see this. We're going to have this come back in front of us again after it goes to the port and the HRA. It'll also be back in front of us during the budget mm -hmm. discussions because there obviously are budget implications here. And so... I just give that um, as the broader next steps um, to inform however you want to set up your comments or whatever. But Okay. Um, well, if it pleases the court, I, I, I do have – I have two <laughs> – that was for, for you, Melissa. I have two <laughs> – I just had two recommendations for them to consider. Okay. Would that be appropriate? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I was going to make one quick comment. And, um, uh the one thing that um, I did have a question about, but we don't, I don't need an answer now, but I think it would be good to build into the presentation is just what will happen to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund? How does that fit into kind of the big picture? Again, I don't need an answer right now, but just to have it along with the Venn diagram in the future. No. Okay, Council Member D'Alessandro. I appreciate you. Uh, thank you, Acting Mayor. I actually had also a recommendation that they tell us what happens to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, so thank you for that. Uh, the other thing I was going to say is you might want to I, – I, I would hate for us to make this change and for us to not have done or at least plan to do a service assessment of the Port Authority itself. So I, I would recommend that you plan for that um, because moving a bunch of, of – stuff into something that we haven't done an assessment on doesn't seem to make sense to me. So um, I, soon after that, I want to make sure we're right-sided in terms of the way that that place works. Um, that would be a recommendation. And then the third one I had a recommendation was um, uh, related to Council Member Nelson. Um, it seems to me that if we're going to expand the authority of the port, um, we need to expand the port authority's representation uh, and so a consideration of adding res more residents to that uh, board seems to make sense to me. So I would like to see some thought about that. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Council Member Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> just to, to clarify, Council Member Nelson, we used to do it that way with the HRA. And okay. then I think we realized we were doing it incorrectly. Yeah. And so That's that was, yes, because we did <laughs> used to vote on HRA members. And then I think we realize that the mayor does technically appoint them and we confirm them That's maybe. Statutory, right? yes, yes, I believe so. So um, yes, yeah, so you were you were not you were not wrong. It's just that we were all making a mistake at one point. Um, so I just by way of comments, um, I came in honestly, 
I came on came in very unsure of how I wanted to vote on this motion because the word support gave me a little bit of heartburn, if I'm completely honest. I was not sure that I was comfortable supporting these specific recommendations. Um, I will say the conversation that we've had tonight, the answers that I've gotten from staff have been very helpful and, and um, have reassured me in a lot of ways. Um, and, you know, as the, the acting mayor mentioned, this is not the final say. This is the beginning of the conversation. And so um, I would say, you know, to that end, I, I can support this motion tonight. Um, I will, you know, I will echo, well, first of all, to be clear, I want to join the Venn Diagram Caucus. So just <laughs> want to have that on record. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I will say I do have some concerns about what this means for the operation of the HRA board as well. Um, and, and to be frank, I, you know, I mean, if, if we're saying the HRA is going to be more focused on housing, particularly housing, you know, at or around 20 and fewer units, that other responsibility has to go somewhere. I am, I am a little bit unsure of the Port Authority being, I don't know how to put this, not I'm a little bit un, of a little bit unsure of adding additional responsibility and a little additional authority. To be frank, in the port authority, um, partly because I think the port authority's plate is already quite full, both in terms of responsibility and authority. Um, partly because of the leadership transition that will be happening, and um, just I that that piece of it gives me a little bit unease. As I said. You know, it has to go somewhere, and and I, you know, for the reasons you laid out, it certainly doesn't make sense to create an economic development, <clears throat> excuse me, economic development authority. So, um, those those are just sort of general concerns I have, um, but I I think, um, on the whole, I think this is a good direction to go, um, and I I will say again, I I think in particular the the explanation of the the sort of um, people versus brick and mortar. Uh, focus for the HRA, I think that is going to be a really, really good thing. I think having additional eyes and, and additional involvement and additional work, frankly, on on a lot of those programs that are, are people focused is going to be really good and really important. So um, I, I think some of the details I'm, I'm not 100% sold on yet, but I, I think I can move forward with the conversation tonight. So thank you again for all of your work on this. We have any other comments, suggestions for staff before we move on? And of course, I'm looking for somebody who would make a motion. I'm ready to make the motion. All right, Councilmember Lohman. Unless somebody on HRA wants to do it. <laughs> All right, Councilmember right. Coulter. Pinch hitting here. Uh, Mayor, I will move to support and continue to explore the recommendations uh, above and present these recommendations to the HRA and Port Authority Boards. Second. So we have a motion by Councilmember Coulter and a second by Councilmember Lohman. With no further discussion on this, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Thank you. Thank you so much. You. Okay, so now we are on to item 5.3, our 2022 legislative session review. Thank you. Madam Acting Mayor Carter <laughs> and Council Good members. Job. That was great. <laughs> to say it slowly. Um, so, uh, so now that the, the chances of a special session are, what I've been saying is n near zero um, for the summer. Um, they're never zero, but um, they're near zero. Um, we thought it was appropriate to come back to the council um, with uh, Katie Sen from Mr. Lee and Kramer. And she will walk through in a little bit more detail what I walked through on May 23rd with the council right as the session was closing. I'm um, just detailing what happened during the session. And um, um, again, you've got the report uh, that was an attachment to the item that goes through in great detail um, everything that, that happened, including um, a focus on the Bloomington initiatives. And I will not steal Katie's thunder by um, telling you um, what's in her report. Thank you. 
Good evening, Council. Um, and there's sadly not as much thunder as I was hoping to deliver tonight, um, as I think you all know. Um, but I just wanted to start out by, I'm Katie Sen with Messerly Kramer, and I represent Bloomington at the Capitol. Um, and I think you already know this, but you have a lot of folks on your staff and team and the mayor who are often up there doing calls, doing Zooms, um, doing meetings with legislators, and it, it makes, a, makes a big difference. So thank you to all of them. And they're also called upon by a lot of our friend groups to come testify and be expert witnesses. So Bloomington really does have a great presence up at the Capitol. Um, so I think, I know you went through some of the priorities, so I'll move quickly kind of through that. I was just going to set the stage um, about where session landed and what could be coming next. Um, so as I think you all know, it was not a budget year, so the legislature did not have to pass any bills. It was it's a typically a bonding year. There was an over $9 billion state surplus, and that did not include federal money. So there was, even though it was not a budget year, I think there was a lot of hope that budget bills would still pass in most areas. Um, I think on both sides of the aisle, there was, there was interest in trying to um, allocate some of that funding. Um, and so... Um, during se the very end of session with a week to go, the leaders got an agreement on a deal, and which is also a really good sign. I think a lot of us felt optimistic that because they had a global deal that the chairs could work out some of the individual pieces. The global deal was to have $4 billion in the tax bill, $4 billion in spending, and $1.4 billion in a bonding bill, as well as $150 million in cash for bonding, which would have gone to um, a lot of uh, nonprofit groups in particular that had requests at the Capitol. So I think there was even more disappointment then that, that those bills didn't cross the finish line because it felt like they were very close. I would say um, we were in that boat of kind of getting to see what could have passed and didn't, which in some ways was good because I think it showed that we made a lot of progress with legislators and got a lot of support, but on the other hand was even more disappointing. So to kind of go through some of the, the big items that we were working proactively on, obviously the, the sales tax was something that we worked on, and we were in the House bill, the Senate bill, and we were in the final conference committee agreement that was never signed and officially sent to the floor, but all of the articles were released to the public and gone over in conference committee, and they had a press conference, um, and we were in that version of the bill. They took out Duan, but everything else remained. Um, and so that was you know, really disappointing that that bill did not cross the finish line. On the bonding bill side, we were in the governor's bonding recommendations for the public health building, which was when, you know, as you all know, the bonding process is really a year-long process. So the city had to submit requests in June, last June, a year ago. And um, at that point, the public health facility was the top bonding priority. We knew it was going to be kind of going in tandem with the sales tax and trying to figure out where was you know where was the best spot for it? So we kind of pushed both um, both places until the end, where we saw how things shook out. So that was initially in the governor's um, bonding recommendations. The House and the Senate never released a bonding bill either side. So there were a lot of discussions at the end. I was getting calls about you know which of our priorities and obviously in communication with legislators about the tax bill provisions as well, because there was some overlap there. Um, but in the end, neither the House or the Senate put forward a bonding bill publicly. So we never really got to see what they would have done. Um, although I, I mean, I think there was, um, I think, I think our pro I, they were thinking of our projects as being covered in the tax bill. So in the end, I think that's probably what would have happened if both bonding and tax bill had passed. Um, silver lining was that the HRA bill did pass I was just joking with Erica that sh I should count how many bills passed because it wasn't very many, and that was one of them, so that was exciting. Um, and she did a great job coming and, and talking to legislators. It ended up having really complicated bill language for a very simple bill that was just increasing the membership from five to seven. She did a really good job explaining why we needed that complicated language, which has a lot to do with the fact that your HRA is 51 years old, and there <laughs> weren't a lot of other um, HRAs at the time that, yours, that the Bloomington one was created. So that was definitely a silver lining to have that bill passed. Um, I won't go into detail on some of the other things, but we were following Metro Park funding through the Met Council. The governor had included that in his recommendations, although not at the amount we had hoped for and the other 
um, park groups had hoped for as well. There were some corridors of commerce language that Carl Keel helped analyze and weigh in on, um, just trying to understand how that would impact Bloomington and especially 494 and all the projects, the large project that's happening, and, and we're hoping to get additional funding for um, that big project. Um, and then housing policy, that was something that a lot of the city groups really worked closely on. Um, nothing passed. There was a lot of, I would say, housing policy that we had concerns about that, that really limited local control. Um, and the League of Minnesota Cities and Metro Cities and MLC also um, worked really hard on that issue this year. And, and noth there was no housing bill that passed, um, so that didn't pass. Um, so, you know, overall... I, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't feel disappointing because I feel like on the issues we worked on, we got a lot of traction, and I think if they had passed the bills that were part of the global agreement, we would be really standing here feeling good about what passed. Um, the other frustrating part is that there's going to be a whole new legislat legislature next year, and about a third of the members will be new, possibly more, depending on who wins and loses elections. That's the going to be the biggest changeover in legislators since 1970, which is kind of the year they, I think the legislature became partisan, so that's the year that is sort of the starting point. So as long as they can remember, that's going to be kind of the biggest switch of new legislators, which means we'll, we'll be starting over to some extent, um, re-educating folks about our priorities. Um, there'll be potentially new majorities, new chairs, obviously the governor's up for election, so it's going to be a, a big year and um, and we'll, we'll be back next year, you know, with a lot of new faces. Um, the other things, you know, just looking, for, looking ahead to this election, which you all are very familiar with, you know, redistricting is going to play a big role in the elections. There's a lot of primaries in August. Um, I, think, I think all those dynamics are playing out in the special session discussions and whether there was going to be a special session. So we had scheduled this time for now, hoping that maybe there would be a special session and we could update this summary to tell you <laughs> all of the things that passed. Um, but uh, about two weeks ago, the, the leaders announced that they were no longer negotiating, and I think the Senate was pretty clear that they had made their last offer of the summer. So, of course, as Shane mentioned, you know, you're always trying to read between the lines, like, well, does that mean in September you'll be back? But, um, you know, it, it's not off the table that after the primaries there could be additional discussion, although I think at this point most people would say the chances are, are pretty low. But um, I think those are the main things I wanted to hit on. Anything else I'm... Obviously, happy to answer questions too. Council members, any questions? All right, I am seeing none. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Have a good evening. <clears throat> Acting Mayor and Council members, just one comment before uh, Katie and Shane walk away. I, I again just want to acknowledge the amount of effort that those two put in. Um, Katie is a fantastic advocate for us, uh, not just at the legislature, but uh, with the administration and the, the various departments uh, for the state of Minnesota. And uh, we really appreciate the work that she does on our behalf. And as you know, Shane spends a lot of time talking to Katie. Uh, those two are uh, like, kind of like Batman and Robin for us, so uh, appreciate the work that they do. And I'm not going to say who's who. Because <laughs> we all do. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much. Um, okay, so then we are moving on to item 5.4, our city council policy and issue update. And I will summarize um, what we heard during the listening session today before the council meeting. So we had three speakers. Um, Mazen Ghani uh, joined us and talked a little bit about uh, some crime issues that he has been dealing with uh, personally at his residence in East Bloomington, uh, made a couple of comments around um, police presence and and then some of the uh, engagement that he's had with police and being appreciative of that, uh, spoke a little bit about uh, the harassment that he's been experiencing um, from a group of people, uh, again, and, and some re repeating crime issues. And so he is going to be working with Chief Hodges and the police department uh, to continue to work to resolve those issues and um, and seemed like there was good resolution there. Uh, we also heard from Sally Ness, who had a question related to our city code and the definition of fraud as it relates to licensing 
and wanted to know how that applies to our conditional use permit. And then we also, um, uh, Mr. Mueller, who spoke during public comment this evening, also had joined us, but then decided to save his comments for uh, the agenda item tonight, uh, so item 5.2. So that is a high level summary of our listening session. Any other, I don't think we have to take any other hmm. comments or anything. Okay. So do we have anybody who has a policy or issue update that they want to share? Council Member Lohman. So um, I will, I think at this point in time, it makes sense to bring forward the, uh, um, uh, the neighborhood wanted to have us as a council look at that Ames money as from, from Lindale, 106th Street down, um, as a policy discussion to see if it makes some sense to, um, you know, alter our, 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 our policy. And so I'm looking to see if there's any other council members that would be willing to have a look at that um, uh, before we bring that back. So, um, may I ask a question uh, related to that, uh, yes. Madam Mayor? Um, so, so when I when I what I thought I heard uh, Mr. Keel say was that we, if we were to consider it, we would look at it kind of as a blanket update from a policy perspective. And I wrote down when damages are paid to that fund because a specific issue happened should we apply that funding to that damaged area was that did anybody else understand that as the central question i just want to make sure i'm clear on the the central question that we're you're consider, asking us to consider if i could i i like the way that you frame that because i think that that's so i think what this council member is trying to find out is is this somehow different um than uh other things that have come before us because of that that very phrase there you know there, there was damages that were dealt and um you know have we had that happen in the past you know i haven't been around long enough to uh, to have that that type of situation happen before and is this somehow from a policy perspective different and just a you know a gap in our, our policy maybe the answer to that question is no um, um but i just want to have a deeper deeper dive yeah acting mayor uh, carter council members uh, Council Member Lohman, uh, ask Carl to make his way up here again. I think the answer is that we do not have a specific policy. We have a past practice, right? And so that's what I wanted to, if the council wanted to have that conversation, that's what I would want to bring back forward. And and uh, the way that Council Member D'Alessandro framed it, I think is part of the question that we would bring back for conversation. It's a very specific circumstance of a contribution into the into the total funds so carl did you want to expand on it any more than that maybe just expand a little bit and i think what we would agree i think what we ought to do is put together a little memo that explores this situation so you have a bit of more background and we try to frame it for for a conversation and i think i heard the council say you'd like to have that conversation before we bring that project forward so that we can have this this concept resolved before we actually get into the public hearings for that project um, the only other comment i would make is that uh, our pavement management program, which we're proposing that this street would be wrapped into, assembles a whole bunch of different types of projects. And some of these projects are very expensive. Frankly, this is a very expensive project, Lindale Avenue. Others are less expensive. Some have uh, uh, little challenges with the neighborhood and some, some nuances that are different. And I think what we've done as a matter of practice is we've lumped them together so that we can have similar assessments for all properties. Uh, so the assessment that one pays is not directly related to exactly the cost of that street in front of their home, but rather it's, it's a, a balanced assessment for all the properties that are being built that given year. Um, and we'll go into a whole bunch more on this in the, in the, uh, the, the memo, but that's kind of a, a, a background comment. Thank you, Mr. Keel. And I think that's super helpful to have a better understanding of that. Uh, Council Member Nelson and then D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I appreciate that, and I also appreciate when you when you look into this, if you can, because the city is still paying seventy five percent of it. So to to put all that money back to those homeowners also doesn't make sense. You know, it's seventy five percent the city and everyone else in the city and the community paying for it. So I, I appreciate that staff clarified that earlier. Um, the question in my mind, from how Council Member Delisandro laid uh, kind of teed this up, it was damaged. How much earlier would this 
project is how much earlier is this project being done than it would have been done under our normal PMP and checking the status of that road and and you know how much of its useful life was lost I guess is another consideration that I and think quite frankly that road was very much near its end okay and we let Ames on it okay and and that that does change it for me I mean quite a bit because I mean we're maybe shifting it by a small amount of time when the assessment would have come anyways mm -hmm. so um, that I mean, all I'm saying is maybe don't spend a lot of time on it. A quick summary of the issues and thoughts, and a, a, I think a memo would be helpful. I don't know until reading that memo if I necessarily need to have a whole other meeting on this. Um, I know that'll be a shock for most of my colleagues. So, okay, <laughs> Councilmember Delisandre. Thanks, uh, Councilmember Nelson. You addressed one of my questions with your comments so thank for that the only other thing that I would um, like to maybe know I did some quick math but I don't think I did it right and so if we could get a couple of scenarios um, for example did you say it was hundred and eighty five thousand dollars or something roughly like that right you know what does that what does that mean when what does that mean to the 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 average taxpayer when when it's applied you know peanut buttered across all projects versus what would what would it benefit that 63 people or 63 homes if we explicitly put there like what's the delta there I don't want to get too bent out of shape if we're talking like a hundred bucks versus if we're talking like two thousand dollars so I just would like to understand that too we can put those actual numbers together okay that was just great. as a quick remark I mean the total program is in the range of five to six million dollars mm -hmm. so the hundred eighty five thousand is really not a very large piece of that right uh, versus the total amount that's assessed just to these properties uh, that would be a significant amount towards those but it would seem unfair to put it all towards there to reduce those specific property owners assessments but that's I guess we'll frame that for you yeah that'd be great and I think the 7525 question was another piece of that so thank you thank you Council acting Mayor. so th thank you uh, for that and I, I think that whatever we do I want to make sure that the public is able to because I think that's really the why I'm asking the question uh, is so that so that those folks that are that are in that in that neighborhood and really I think uh, for residents across the city they have a much better understanding of uh, if we don't go into a long dialogue but I, I do I do know we have other priorities um, uh, for the uh, city, I did want to just uh, just take a, uh, move on from that uh, topic. I pause just for a moment and, and put a bow on that topic, uh, Acting Mayor. Um, we will put together the memo. We'll share it with council, and then we'll just have a quick discussion about it and see how the council wants to proceed after having seen the memo. Okay, we won't schedule it for a long policy review. We'll just bring it up at a similar topic or point like this, and then see where you want to go. Okay. Thank you. So then if I could just uh, I'm gonna move on to a different topic. Thank you, uh, staff. Uh, thank you, Carl, uh, for that, and my colleagues, too, uh, for helping to frame those uh, questions. So over the uh, weekend, did have the opportunity uh, uh, to attend um, uh, the Minnesota League of Cities uh, because somebody was out of town. Um, so I got to sit in for them. And I'll let my other colleagues maybe cover a little bit more of those items if they want. But um, I had the opportunity to attend uh, both the Understanding Local Property Taxes, which was always uh, fun uh, to kind of go uh, through that. And uh, they really brought forward, I think, just a really good um, uh, presentation on that. And one of the things I thought was interesting uh, was that the city of, I think it was either Minneapolis or one of the surrounding suburbs, had just kind of a... Um, kind of video tutorial kind of talking about uh, tax capacity and that type of thing on their on their web page you can kind of go through and they made that available uh, for their residents and so I I, um, um, I know we've done other things in the past uh, uh, certainly around this but um, wanted to just make sure that we we're doing everything we can to, to try to make sure folks understand uh, um, uh, property taxes, maybe assessments, you know, because uh, these things get complicated. And when you're when you're up here, um, kind of doing inside baseball, it gets easy to to, to kind of remember that these things are, are not something that 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 uh, that residents typically uh, uh, deal with, um, uh, maybe other than your wife when she sees the increase. <laughs> and so I get to go home and explain that uh, the increase and what that looks like. So, um, so I just would hope that we would maybe look to to try to find new and, and creative ways of of trying to communicate that across. And then the other reason uh, for going uh, to uh, the uh, to the, is to to kind of acknowledge that we uh, have finally achieved. I know this is something the the mayor um, has been a, a big uh, pusher of. Uh, unfortunately, is not here to 
today uh, is the uh, Green Step uh, uh, Cities program. We achieved uh, our, our steps four and steps uh, five. And I, I want to just, uh, you know, thank both staff and, and council uh, for uh, their support of that. Uh, and really allowing us to kind of move forward. That, that, that's a significant achievement in such a very short period of time. Uh, I don't think we've seen many other cities be able to accomplish that. Of course, uh, you know, we, we, saw a we saw a bunch of them getting four and five while we were there. But uh, again, I want to just thank the, uh, each one of you uh, as a council and, uh, and staff uh, for your support of that work. Uh, it, it does take a, uh, a village uh, to achieve uh, all these goals. Thank you. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Madam Acting Mayor. Um, yeah, two quick things. Um, one, just a fun thing that happened this weekend. Of course, it was Pride Weekend in the Twin Cities, and um, I had the honor of speaking as part of the elected officials contingent at the pre uh, parade launch conference and got to plug our pride, and uh, nobody knew about it. So I was very happy that I got to say that in front of, you know, hundreds of people. Um, and um, uh, our Minneapolis. Uh, pre uh, City Council President uh, Ms. Jenkins, I think, will will be appreciative of an, an invitation, uh, which is great. So uh, looking forward to that. Um, elsewise, I did want to just mention kind of dovetailing the last two topics we had together on the HRA assessment with the Port Authority and our legislative priorities. Uh, it was, I believe, that there's been an ongoing conversation with, with, a, with a resident about opening up the South Loop de Development Fund um, and I think we should look into whether or not we want to increase our interest in that as a legislative priority if we're going to do this expansion. Um, and I know it's kind of on our passive list, kind of sort of maybe, but um, if we could think about um, maybe assessing that at a higher priority so that we could leverage um, that to expand along with the way that we're planning to expand the port. I think they have to go together if we are going to do it because of the legislative session, you know, that tees up come January next year. So um, any anybody have any major pain about that or should any thoughts at all? Just throwing that out there. You're into it? Okay, uh, great. Council uh, Member. Acting Mayor Carter and Council Members, Council Member D'Alessandro, I, I don't believe it's accurate to say that we have it as a passive thing within our legislative uh, platform, uh, that we have not sought to um, change any of the, the guardrails or the parameters on the, the South Loop funding. Okay. Um, when we bring forward our proposed uh, platform later this year, uh, we will make a note to uh, have that as a discussion point. Yeah, that, I think that would be great. I, I, they just sounded like uh, they were connected in some odd way, and if if we could, you know, parallel them, it might make some sense. Oh, of course, if we decide not to, I get it, but I want to be sure we have a conversation. Sure. Sure. Thank you, appreciate it. That's all I had. Councilmember Coulter. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. A few uh, quick things. Um, just quickly, since this is our last meeting before it happens, I'm sure everyone who's watching council meeting at 9:45 at night already knows about it. But Summerfet is on for Sunday, July 3rd, because what better day to celebrate the 4th of July than the 3rd of July? <laughs> um, I had to miss it last year, so I'm looking forward to it uh, this year. It's always a great time down at uh, Normandale Lake. Hope to see you all there. A um, couple of other things uh, that I wanted to bring up, though. Um, one, in a more general way, I recently um, <clears throat> had a meeting um, regarding uh, local efforts at regulating payday loans and recognizing the nature of this issue and what would be involved with it um, as and you know the the potential of doing something on a city level um, would require a significant investment in terms of resources and um, council time and effort to, to say nothing of staff time and effort and prioritization um, that being said uh, this is something I want to raise is something that I, I, I would like to put this on the council's radar because we do have three payday lenders within the city of Bloomington and that may not seem significant, but that is the same number as operate within the city of Minneapolis, which has roughly three and a half times as many people. And we know the numbers. And I, I normally try to choose my words carefully, but to be frank, it's a scam. These loans are operating at an average of 214% annual interest. The average loan is somewhere around $487, and the average person who takes out 
a payday loan takes out seven of them. So we are talking about thousands of dollars in loans and many, many thousands of dollars in interest. And so this, I mean, this is, it, this is just something that I wish would happen at the state level, but like so many other things has not. So I just want to put it on the radar as, as something that I hope this council will look into because I think it is, it is an issue that is, is affecting a lot of folks and, and um, holding a lot of folks back. So I'm just going to put that out there. Um, the more sort of specific request that I would like to put out there as well, um, I saw recently that the city of Maple Grove uh, put in place a moratorium on new rental licenses for single family homes. And I know we've had conversations about house flipping and the residential housing market and ensuring that that is accessible to first time home buyers, to folks with lower incomes and so on. And um, I, I, you know, understanding that, that any moratorium that goes into place has to do so uh, for the purpose of studying an issue. And so I would like to put it out there as, as something I would be interested in pursuing um, so that we can study the issue more thoroughly um, and address some of these issues that have, have caused a lot of heartburn and a lot of problems for folks looking to move into single family homes. So I would like to solicit council opinion on that possibility. And that's, again, that is, um, it would be a, a temporary moratorium on new new rental licenses for single family homes. Council member D'Alessandro. Just a quick comment on that. Um, and this may be something that would be useful to everybody to see. I'm not sure if it was put out in a one weekly or not. Um, but I know that I asked, um, not that long ago for an assessment of rentals. Um, and we, they put out a really pretty robust kind of assessment. Um, you know, I think it was the reason I was asking about it was related to, do we have, you know, large hedge funds renting, you know, buying up our properties and, and renting them out and becoming, you know, kind of, um, absent landlords and everything. And we don't seem to have that problem here. No. And so, um, I, I, I think it would be worth us to maybe, to, to maybe put that out again in one weekly to reassess that because I, I'm not sure why Maple Grove decided to do that, but I'm, I'm not sure we have the same problems would be my, my thoughts there. Thank you. Looking at that data. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes. And I guess I would add to, I'd be, I worry because I know we don't have enough three and four bedroom rentals apartments. And so families, often rely on rental housing and I just wouldn't want to have some unintended consequences right of limiting um, those opportunities that families need families with large or, or with a lot of kids right or or multiple generations living under one household um, so I do have some concerns honestly uh, but I think it's a good um, I mean I, th I think it would be interesting to look at if we think that there is a problem um, I just yeah, I guess I do have some some questions about it, and 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 really, my concerns are more around the unintended consequences of doing that when we just have a housing shortage for renters and homeowners. So, uh, Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I I would be interested in looking at it. I don't know that I'd be interested in a moratorium and shutting it down based on the data I've already seen um, there, but maybe if that changes. Um, because I do think it uh, may be a growing concern. I just read today something like 12% of the homes that were bought last year in the Twin Cities were bought by investors. So, um, you know, maybe our community isn't as experiencing that as much as some other communities or something different, but it's obviously something's going on there a little bit. Um, but I don't know that we need to, you know, shut it down. That's going to have huge impacts. Um, I'm not sure I'd defer to... Uh, or city attorney Mandershide uh, with regards to notice requirements before a moratorium on housing, um, I think uh, are in play there. So we'd have a, a quite a bit of process, public hearing, things like that. And I just, at this point, not uh, sure that that we need to go that far. But I, I, I agree with you on the concern, Councilmember Coulter. I, I've raised it a few times myself. So, and full disclosure, I'm the owner rental property in the city of Bloomington. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
if, if I may act, uh, Mayor. Yes, Gene. Um, uh, I appreciate the reminder that staff had put out a memo on this previously. I did have a chance to talk to Councilmember Coulter about this last week. Uh, have not pulled that memo. We'll do that and recirculate it for the council to review again. Uh, I also have not had a chance yet to speak to the Maple uh, Grove City Administrator, uh, which I have on my to-do list as well. I also, my understanding, because um, I, we had gotten an email from a gentleman who was wor um, upset about the fact that, you know, he, his belief that there were a bunch of big international and national companies buying up houses. And um, and one of the th points that I did have, uh, I asked uh, Ms. Moore to clarify is whether or not we can provide any kind of requirements around who's buying what kind of properties, and we can't. And so that's also, I mean, like we can't, my understanding is we can't say, okay, X, Y company from Chicago, you're not allowed to buy this, but you over here, you can buy the house. So um, just another kind of piece of information um, as part of this conversation. And and if I may, Council Acting Member Mayor, Del Sandro. Um, according to the press that I just pulled up, the, the reason for that moratorium in Maple Grove seems to have been indicated by the fact that they've seen a 30% increase in rental licenses in just the past two years. So they were kind of alarmed at the spike in them. I would love to have as part of additional data what our growth rate is and if it's a much more steady thing or if we're also seeing a, a, a kind of a hockey stick. Um, that may that may mm -hmm. change the point of view here. But uh, from what I could tell, we don't have that same challenge here because there's not enough houses to rent out, let alone buy in the first place. But but I think uh, if, if Ms. Moore or whoever is the right person could also provide us kind of like a growth chart on that, that would be helpful. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Otherwise, I will turn it over to Jamie to see if he has comments. Okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Council members, uh, two items for you tonight. Uh, first of all, I uh, want to share with council members that we are returning to the town hall engagement format. Uh, so the next one will be scheduled for Tuesday, July 19th. We will be doing it at the Normandale Lake Band Shell. So it'll be outdoors, and we're going to hope that uh, the middle of July is uh, very nice. Um, so that'll be at 7 p.m. on Tuesday, July 19th. Uh, still working out some of the format details uh, with the mayor and our communication staff, but I think the uh, likely format looks something like this. The first um, segment, no more than like 10 to 15 minutes, will be a rapid fire rundown on uh, activities or, or uh, hot topics at the city and just provide an update to residents or attendees of what's happening and, and why these things are, are uh, being prioritized. And then have a lengthier Q&A session in which we're going to try to solicit questions in advance and then uh, put them into uh, a tumbler or a hat or some other device that we will come up with that guarantees that every question that's submitted has uh, a, f a fair chance of being pulled out from the hat uh, or the tumbler and then the mayor will answer or council members will figure that out uh, will answer as many questions as possible in the allotted time um, so want to make sure that we have a way for people to get their questions in and make sure that uh, they know that their questions uh, have every chance of being answered along with everybody else's so still working on that uh, our communications team will be uh, getting promotion out so that uh, folks will know about Tuesday, July 19th for Town Hall. Uh, the second item that I wanted to share is, uh, since the mayor is not here and he would be the better person to deliver this one, but the uh, mayor and I were both in Paris last week with the uh, USA Expo 2027 uh, bid committee uh, and a number of supporters and also uh, representatives uh, from the federal government. Uh, and the purpose of that uh, delegation was to uh, attend the General Assembly of the Bureau of International Expositions. This is the international body that decides uh, which cities or countries will host expositions. Uh, the format for the meeting last week uh, had all five of the uh, candidate countries making presentations to the delegates of the BIE. Uh, the other four competitors are Thailand, Spain, Argentina, and Serbia. 
Each of the candidates had 30 minutes to make a presentation. Uh, hopefully you've had a chance to see that as we were able to um, record the live stream of the presentations and share those uh, with the council members. And uh, we also had uh, quite a bit of uh, media uh, focus on the USA Minnesota delegation that was there. So a couple points that I want to make. Uh, first of all, again, this is not a City of Bloomington initiative. The Minnesota Expo 2027 bid committee is its own independent 501c3 corporation or nonprofit organization. Uh, they have a president, they have a board, uh, they're doing their own fundraising, uh, and they are coordinating the activities around the bid. Uh, the City of Bloomington does have two ex officio board members. The mayor and the city manager are both uh, members of the board. Uh, if the mayor, if Tim Bussey is no longer the mayor, the mayor will still have the seat. If Jamie Verbrugge is no longer the city manager, the city manager will have the seat. That's what it means to have an ex officio uh, position on the board. Um, the, uh, the process moving forward is that the um, uh, BIE will be uh, looking at the formal applications from all five. Uh, we'll be doing site visits to those countries uh, later this year, and then we'll have another General Assembly at the end of November, at which point each of the candidates will have another presentation that they will give to the delegates. Uh, the, the final decision is going to be made in June of 2023, uh, and if the USA is selected, the dates for the United States uh, uh, proposal uh, which would be here in the city of Bloomington would be May 15th through August 15th. That's the, those are the parameters for the uh, three month event. And again, the site that was put forward by the bid committee uh, includes adjacent lands east of Mall of America. It's a vacant 30 acre parcel uh, currently used as uh, parking or event space for a number of outdoor events. Uh, if people drive past there now, I think they'll see a Metro Transit buses out there. I think they're teaching bus drivers how to drive buses. And also they were having, I think, a bus rodeo last week too. So, um, And then uh, also connecting to another parcel that's owned by the city that used to be the Ramada uh, Hotel at 494 and 24th. So um, uh, lengthy process ahead, still another year before we find out. Uh, and as we go forward, we'll continue to share information both with the council and the community about uh, where we're at. So I wanted to make sure that we shared that with the public and uh, happy to answer any questions anybody has. <clears throat> any questions? Council Member D'Alessandro. Thank you, Madam Acting Mayor. Just one question for you, City Manager. Um, is there a process between the November and June timeframe where they whittle down from five to some smaller number or will all five go to the end? Thank you. Um, Acting Mayor and Council Members, Council Member D'Alessandro, the, the only place uh, between now and next June where there may be a whittling is as a result of those site visits. And so they, they go through a process of reviewing each of the proposals and then the executive committee actually makes a recommendation to the um, General Assembly about whether a candidate uh, should proceed to final consideration or not. Um, what will happen in June of next year <clears throat> is there would be a round of voting uh, if, if five countries remain. Uh, whoever uh, gets the least amount of votes in that first round gets knocked out and they go back and have another round of voting to for those four and they keep going through that until they have uh, they have a country that is selected. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay. All right. So with that, I think we are done. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second? Second. All right. So Council Member D'Alessandro made the first motion. Council Member Martin made the second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Aye as well. And <laughs> nay. All right, motion passes 6-0. Good grief.